Både det ena och andra. Är ni, är ni redo? Yes. Sen här texten, den är för dig. Den är för dig, den är för dig. Alla de här texterna. Han älskar dig. Om du tar emot honom. Tror att han är Guds son. Att, ge, att Gud uppväckte Jesus från det döda på tredje dagen. Tog och renade dig från allt. Alla dina synder. Så får du evigt liv här och på, i himlen. Här på jorden och i himlen. Det är vårt budskap idag. Johannes 3 och 16. När de är här låt oss ge en stor varm applåd till Dogge. Dogge Lito. Lite. Ja, vad är det för något då? Ja, det är en, 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 en jättehärlig skiva. En Johannes 3 och 16 skiva som vi ska göra då. Så sa han, ja men det är underbart. Så jag, ja, jag tror det. Jag är katolik, sa du. Och så skrev du den här fantastiska versen. Ja, jag bara skrev den. Jag har många texter om, om Bibeln, Jesus, Gud. Jag har ju många som helst. Så att, jag har många på lager. Uh-huh. Bara skriva. Uh-huh. Oh. Tack Gud för allt som du någonsin gett mig Tack Gud för min vackra dotter och min tjej Tack Gud för styrkan, lyckan och modet Att du tog tag i mig när jag tappar ordet Jag rångar allting och tar tillbaks det idag Och förlåt mig för allt som jag många gånger sa Tack Gud för taket, vinet och brödet Och allt det vackra som du gav mig lörde För kärlek, frihet och änglar i sänd I mörkens det större så tur namn igen För livet är vin och gullet finner Att det låter sanningen Spreka mina läppar När jag langar rans Som verkligen pepprar För det satt att alla hundar Har sin egen dag Och det heliga ord Kommer alltid vara min lag Spirituella visningar Över hela min hus När jag är här idag För att tacka min Gud Tack Gud Som är en ovanligt aktiv man. I år är det 20 år sedan han grundade Livets ord, en församling med bas i Uppsala. Som snabbt väckte stor uppmärksamhet för sin religiösa intensitet och sina hängivna förkunnare och anhängare. Livets ord har också varit starkt kritiserat både inom och utanför det religiösa Sverige. och Det används ord som sekt, järntvätt och framgångsdyrka. Idag har vår lördagsgäst... Hela världen som arbetsfält. Han är en flitig besökare i till exempel Ryssland, Asien och USA. Han bor sedan något år tillbaka i Jerusalem. Han har skrivit ett 40-tal böcker översatta till 30 språk. Och så här presenteras han nu av rörelsen själv. Another day of victory with all that Read the news report with an inspiring message by Pastor Ulf Ekman and testimonies of what God is doing around the world. Powerful, precise, joyful, and sharp and true. Change your life forever. In the news report, you will have updates on the mission's work in Operation Jabotinsky. Request your copy of this free magazine by writing to the address on your screen. 
visit our website at www.ulfekman.org. Ja, välkommen hit, Tack så Ulf Ekman. Tack så det var en mäktig presentation av dig där. Ja, det var inte dåligt. <laughs> det ser ut av det där som att ni verkligen är big business nu numera. Är ni det? Ja, alltså, vi har ett arbetsfält som är mycket, mycket större än för 20 år sedan när vi började. Och, och det är internationellt. Så att jag tillbringar ju mycket tid utanför Sverige nu för tiden. Men tjänar ni mycket pengar och så? Som, för att det måste ju kosta slantar att göra en sån här ja, stor presentation. Det handlar ju inte om det. Vi har ju naturligtvis en budget och en omsättning som alla andra organisationer, ideella organisationer och profanorganisationer. Syftet är att eh, berätta om Jesus för människor över hela världen. Eh, och det är självklart att en organisation kostar pengar. Det gör det ju. Du, du är ju väldigt framträdande i den här presentationen. Är det någon slags personkult som råder runt här? Nej, det tror jag inte. Utan det ser det... ju lite så ut här. Nej, det här. Jag tror att det här är ju... Det här lilla sticket vi såg nu går ju ut på internationell tv. Och ofta är det ju så att det är kring en förkunnare, men det är organisationen, det är budskapet som är det viktiga. Sen åker jag runt och predikar och av, dem, av detta görs det bland annat tv-program- och det är väl där var väl början på något av de här tv-programmen, tror jag. Mm. Men det här är en organisation som är, är noggrann och eh, ni är, är väl planerar allt ni gör naturligtvis. Du är själv en, en, en genomtänkt person. Hur ser ditt resonemang ut till exempel när du gör en sån här intervju? Eh, du menar som idag? Ja, som idag. Ja. Jaha. Eh, vad, 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 känner, för... vad känner du är, är det viktigaste för dig med en sån här intervju? Ja. Du har naturligtvis en tanke med det. Ja, alltså det är jag glad att jag blir inbjuden. Mm. Eh, sen tycker jag om formatet att man kan sitta och samtala. Jag har ju varit som du vet på tv ganska många gånger mm. under slopp, men eh, det är slags eh, att man blir avbruten eller man skriker på varandra eller eh, det är så skönt att slippa det. Så det är klart att, att sitta i en soffa och kunna tala till punkt, det, det, det är positivt. Mm. Förbereder du dig på något speciellt sätt? Så där? Är, det, är det medvetet? Känner du att det här är en möjlighet att värva nya anhängare en sån här intervju? Nej, jag tror att eh, dels att förklara eh, frågor som ställs, eh, därför det finns alltid en massa frågor runt omkring livets ord. Mm. Eh, dels att eh, få tillfälle att lite mer personligt tala om centralgestalten som är Jesus Kristus sin tull fekman. Ja, och därför så tycker jag att eh, när jag förbereder mig då, då är... Då är det väl mest de sakerna. Annars så tror jag den vanliga förberedelsen som jag som förkunnare har, det är bön och bibelläsning. Det är alltid så. Man kan inte göra någonting utan att be och samtala med Herren. Ber du för en sån här situation som en sån ja. här intervju? Ja, det gör jag naturligtvis. Det är, mm. det är, det är i alla situationer jag hamnar mm. i. Därför jag tror på detta att vi lever inte ensamma. Vi lever i en gemenskap och en relation till han som har skapat oss. Och eh, den är vardaglig. Jag kan eh, ge mina bekymmer. Jag kan tala med inte det där ute utan en han, en person, Jesus Kristus. Och det är väldigt eh, härligt att kunna göra det. Ulf Ekman, eh, anade jag rätt när jag tyckte att jag såg en liten rynka i ditt ögonbryn när du såg de där första bilderna från, som var gamla. Ja, äh... när, när du står utan skägg och ja, just det, just det. kraftfullt förkunnar ja. på ett lite annat sätt mm. än den mer slipade gestalt som syntes än. Äh, nej, har det alltså, hänt jag, någonting? Äh, här, eller? Ja, självklart har det hänt någonting. Äh, rynkan då möjligtvis, det kanske är därför att så i så många år och så långt har gått och det ofta är alltid gamla bilder och ofta bara några sekunder. Mm. Och det ger ofta en liten orättvis bild. Annars så är det ju självklart att, att, att de bilderna finns och, och när det gäller din fråga om, om jag har förändrats, jag predikar ju fortfarande. Självklart har man mognat och breddats, ja, men det har ju med livet att göra. 20 år, är, 20 år är en lång tid. Men har du medvetet tonat ner dig själv lite grann för att vidga den bas som ni står på? Jag tror inte att det är någon slags slugtaktik om det, om det är det du tänker. Utan jag tror att livet är så. När man, för mig är livet eh, Jesus Kristus. Det var den stora händelsen i mitt liv när jag mötte honom. Och vandringen med honom som en kristen människa, som alla kristna människor har, kommer att prägla dig eh, och förändra dig för, och förhoppningsvis förvandla dig. Så det är klart att, att man ändras under livets gång. Men att sitta och ha någon slags medveten taktik för att försöka nå längre fram. Jag tror inte det fungerar. Men det har ändå hänt någonting som gör att ni har en lite annan framtoning idag. Ja, det tror jag. Jag menar, jag menar vilken organisation är exakt den samma eh, från 20, om du tittar på en 20-årsperiod? 
ingen är ju det. Så det är ju självklart att, att det har hänt saker. Jag läser, Ulf Ekman, i din senaste bok, Dagen då Gud sökte mig, att det kommer att komma en stark besökelsetid i Sverige. Och den har till och med börjat komma, skriver du. Ja, Vad stundar du det på? Jag tror man tittar där på historien i Sverige så har det med jämna mellanrummet kommit väckelser. Väckelse är grundläggande resultatet av en slags andlig torka att människor kanske lever materiellt väl eller de har social nöd kan slå på båda hållet men i djupet av mitt hjärta är jag otillfredsställd. Det är någonting som saknas. Vad? Jesus Kristus. Detta är, tror jag, det är den svenska folksjälen egentligen alltid har längtat efter och gör nu igen. Och därför kan man se öppenheten om man jämför 80-talet, 70-80-talet och idag. Så talar vi om Gud på ett helt annat sätt. Vi är öppna. Ja, bara detta faktum att jag sitter här och samtalar med dig är ju en förändring. Och jag tror inte minst bland unga människor så, så ser man detta ganska tydligt idag. Faktiskt. Du skriver också att tidningarna kommer att skriva om Jesus från Nazaret och att Gud kommer att besöka Sverige. Hur kommer vi att märka det? Jag tror att man märker det på eh, människor vars liv har blivit förvandlade. Det, det är ju detta evangelium eller Jesus Kristus handlar om. Att eh, hur mycket vi än själva försöker att få till vårt samhälle, göra det rättvist, möta alla behov. Hur mycket vi själva än försöker i vårt eget privata liv eh, leva korrekt och bra och moraliskt så når vi inte fram. Vi har inte medlen. Det är något som saknas. Vi är skapade för att leva med en verklig levande Gud. Och inte förrän vi finner honom finner vi ro. Och när människor finner honom, genom Jesus Kristus, får de fridas liv bli förvandlade. Saker, jag menar inte att det är ett oproblematiskt liv, men en definitiv frälsningsupplevelse förvandlar Människor från hjärtat på djupet. Och det syns i familjelivet, det syns i samhällslivet, det syns i privatlivet. Vi ska återkomma, Ulf Ekman, till dig och tala mer om en liten stund. Nu blir det reklam och sen nyheter. Det är dags att ta fram vinterjackan alltså. När vi kommer tillbaka, mer med Lisa Miskowski, fantastiskt frisyrmode. Och så vår speciella lördagsgäst, Ulf Ekman från Livets ord. Livets ord, 20 år sedan grundandet 1983 i år. Och välkommen också till Daniel Gran, chefredaktör för tidningen Dagen. Tack. Som är vår gästutfrågare. Ska du börja, Daniel? Ja, kan jag? Jag, jag, det bara slog mig när jag såg de här bilderna. Eh, du predikar alltid så kraftfullt, du skriker liksom i, i, i micken. Är, är det liksom en jargong som eh, den typen av predikant som du alltid har? Nej, det tror jag inte alls det. Utan det är så att just de där klippen är ofta från stora möten, utomhusmöten. Där du måste ha en viss volym. Och är det 20, 30, 40 000 människor som lyssnar så, så måste du ha en viss volym för att nå ut med budskapet. Så det är nog bara det. Okay. Eh, sen är det klart att, att, att ibland så talar jag. Nu sitter vi i en soffa. Så det är en helt annan miljö. Så det är klart att, att och det vet ju du naturligtvis, att predikorsammanhang är ju lite annorlunda. Den svenska högmässan har ju kanske inte den typen av väckelse. Framtoning. Pingströrelsen har ju det mer. Som, så att, men... är, man inte van, är man inte van vid den miljön, tänker jag, så låter det, det låter så agitatoriskt och starkt och liksom så att man verkligen ska nästan blåsa som kullmänniskorna som sitter där nere. Ja, nej, det tror jag inte. Utan det handlar ju om volymen som lyssnar. Att det är många tusentals människor som sitter och lyssnar. Men, men eh, det måste man ju anpassa till efter var, var man är. Ja. Det, det är ju självklart. Men jag förstår Daniels fråga där. För jag, jag undrar också, jag tänkte faktiskt fråga om det... He- Tror du att det finns risk för att du skrämmer bort folk genom det här uttrycket att folk faktiskt blir lite rädda för dig och er att ja, det, det här är något ja, det kan jag annat? Mycket, ja, ja, det kan jag mycket väl tänka mig. Eh, inte minst därför att ofta det som klipps ut och visat just på tv, det är ju ofta de här sekvenserna där, där, man liksom, där det är väldigt intensivt. Men om du tittar på ett he, en he, ett helt sammanhang eller en hel predikan eller ett helt bibelsamtal, då tror jag bilden blir annorlunda. Jag måste Men bara visa klart... dig, Ulf Ekman, här apropå just det. Här veckorevyn som inte brukar citeras ofta. Sekterna som tar över din hjärna i den här veckans nummer. Här skriver man bland annat om er livets ord då. Eh, sektprägande inre 
förtrycket finns fortfarande där enligt ja, tidningen. Ja. Det är en tidning som går ut till ganska många gånger. Jo, 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 visst, Vad säger sånt, du om det? Nej, jag säger att sånt där har ju förekommit hela tiden. Jag tar inte det på så speciellt stort allvar. Det, är, det, är inte, det där är inte seriös journalistik. Eh, detta är ju någonting som har med jämna mellanrum har dykt upp. Jag tror också att under de senaste åren så har oerhört många människor sett att vi är en frikyrkoförsamling. Ingen sekt, det kan absolut. du absolut avvisa. Det ja, absolut 100 procent. Mm. Hur ja. tror du för att såna, den här typen av rykten, eh, om det nu är rykten då, hur, hur, dykt, hur, hur har de kommit till så att säga? Eh, började det inte med dagen en gång för länge sedan? Kan vi? <laughs> ja, nej, det ska jag lite. Men, 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 men det är ju ändå så att, att, att eh, det, jag tror aldrig att du kan få ska vi säga, en radikal förkunde som Jesus utan att det blir någon form av kontrovers kring det hela. Eh, det betyder inte att inte den som förkunnar har ett ansvar självklart. Det betyder inte att det inte finns saker som, som kan gå snett eller bevändas till. Men själva evangeliet har i sig en kontrovers och det upprör människors eh, känslor. Jag menar de anspråk som Jesus eh, gjorde när det gäller din och min själs frälsning eh, det sätter ju hela livet på sin spets naturligtvis mm. och det är klart att det, 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 det drar med sig känslor. Men det innebär i så fall att, att ni och du måste vara mer radikala än, än andra så att säga när, när ni bröt fram på det sättet för en hel del kopplas ju ändå till till, till, till dig som ledare och till, till organisationen som sådan att en stiftelse och... Jag tror att det alltid är så och kanske inte minst i början av, av en rörelse eller en församlings framväxt. Du kan ju ta pingströrelsen som ett bra exempel, historiskt exempel eh, på liknande kontroverser. Eh, och ledare oavsett egentligen i vilken position du befinner dig i så, så kommer du alltid få utsättas naturligtvis för för kritik. Det viktiga i detta tror jag är, jag, menar, jag tror inte på några fullkomliga ledare, jag tror inte att jag på något sätt är det. Utan vad man måste till syvende och sist titta på det är ändå, vem är det vi talar om och vad är det vi, vi, vi vill bära fram. Och i, ska vi säga, i mediasammanhang, om man inte får någon rättvisa för själva budskapet, då blir det lite svårt att diskutera naturligtvis. Och det är så var det för, så är det inte nu längre. Men har du, Ulf Ekman, ett speciellt uppdrag från Gud? Alla kristna har det, och det har jag också. Och det är grundläggande. Varje människa som, som tar emot Jesus Kristus och har upplevt sitt liv förvandlat av honom får också eh, ett uppdrag att föra detta vidare. Hur ser ditt uppdrag ut? Vad är det yttersta målet med din verksamhet? Yttersta, med, <coughs> med, yttersta målet är att visa människor i vår omvärld, i Sverige och över hela världen, att du och jag kan få frid med Gud. Att vi kan... Eh, Genom att vända oss till Jesus Kristus, få ett nytt hjärta, bli renade från misstag, synd, problem, saker som vi bär med i våra liv, som, som vi inte orkar ta i tur med själv, men där Jesus kom för att hjälpa oss. Mitt uppdrag är, precis som Paulus i Bibeln, precis som alla predikanter i alla tider, är att försöka berätta detta för så många människor som möjligt, så att de kan ta ställning till Jesus Kristus och ta emot honom i sitt eget liv. Är det några som inte får plats i din kyrka? Några grupper? Nej, det, några människor? Ja, alltså, frågan är lite fel ställd därför att våra möten är öppna för alla människor. Vem som helst får komma på våra möten. Eh, om du frågar om medlemskap och så vidare så är det ju grundläggande så att om du till exempel tillhör en annan religion eller då är det inte aktuellt för dig att vara medlem i vår församling. Då har du ju en inskränkning direkt. Men det är ju inte en inskränkning som vi gör på det sättet. Eh, Evangelium är för alla människor. Gud älskar alla människor. Men när vi tar emot eh, Jesus Kristus så förvandlar han våra liv. Och det kanske inte alla vill, men, men det är en annan sak. En annan rubrik här, Ulf Ekman. Daniel, du ska också få allt fler kyrkans tidning, allt fler beredda viga homopar senaste numret av kyrkans tidning. Många präster, allt mm. fler. Din uppfattning om det? Jag tror inte det. Jag tror inte det är en bra lösning. Jag tror inte att den homosexuella livsstilen är dels bibliskt sanktionerad. Det betyder inte att man inte har respekt för, för, för de som personer. Men jag tror inte att är det... de välkomna till din kyrka? Ja, de är välkomna att komma på möten självklart. Alltså vi, ja, ja, samtalar med, 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 med jämna mellan dem, träffar jag homosexuella, samtalar om evangelium frigör dig. Och detta är väldigt viktigt. Att samhället säger till det här är präst i Svenska kyrkan, antar frikyrkopastorer också, att ni måste göra detta för att uppfylla 
med vissa samhälleliga krav när det är emot en kristen förkunnad samvete tror jag är väldigt olyckligt att pressa sådant på präster. Jag tror det är fel. Mm. Man kan väl säga, och det sades i början här, att du är den mest kontroversiella religiösa ledaren i Sverige de senaste 20 åren. Det är någon slags objektiv sanning, det tror jag man kan säga. Det är ganska objektivt också när man ser din verksamhet och det som du har varit med och byggt upp så är det en extrem objektiv framgångshistoria. Man ser vad som händer i Uppsala, man ser ut över hela världen och sådär. Och du är drygt 50, gissar jag. Eh, skulle kunna säga så här, nu, nu drar jag mig lite tillbaka, jag blir mänt och jag, jag, jag ja, kopplar av lite mer. Och så sätter du dig på världens krutor och knir i Jerusalem. Alltså, vad är, vad är grejen med det? Ja, eh, Jerusalem eh, har ju alltid haft en fascination för alla kristna. Det är ju inte konstigt. Eh, Men de flesta flyr ju därifrån nu. Det är platsen för där Bibeln eh, kom till. Det är platsen där var frälsare dog och uppstod igen. Eh, det är också ett modernt land som eh, på många sätt är missförstått. Och där jag tror inte minst att kristna eh, behöver ta sitt ansvar att eh, förstå... Och relatera till Israel idag. Det är en av orsakerna till att jag är där nere. Okej. Okay. Jag vet att du hade ju Benjamin Netanyahu som gäst uppe i ja, Uppsala mm. för ett par år sedan. Eller sådär. Ja, det han var en av de högerledarna. Han var premiärminister. Ja, under tiden han var hos dig också? Eh, nej, han hade precis slutat då. Men, ja, men, och då var han ju privatperson. Så att, eh... Innebär det att, att du har din politiska förankring så att säga, i högerläget i, i Israel? Jag känner människor från... Eh, alla spekter faktiskt, både på den israeliska och arabsidan. Men jag kan väl säga att jag sitter väl kanske inte exakt i samma läge som Josip Beilin. Men, men, men den grundläggande övertygelsen är inte politisk för mig. Utan den grundläggande övertygelsen om att Israel idag har rätt att existera i en omvärld som väldigt klart markerat säger. Allt ifrån arabnationerna till de olika terroristorganisationerna, inklusive Arafat själv. Att vi ska utplåna Israel. Vi ska ta bort Israel från kartan. Och det menar jag, detta är en orättfärdighet och en orättvisa som är skriande. Eh, och det är väldigt, väldigt farligt också eh, att ha den inställningen. Innebär det att du är emot en palestinsk stat? Jag är inte säker på att den palestinska staten är den bästa lösningen. Jag kan förstå eh, tveksamheten hos israeler som säger att när vi ser varje gång vi, vi eh, släpper till, varje gång vi vill gå den här vägen, eh, att den aborteras, att eh, självmordsbombare kommer in eh, och sliter oss i stycken. Och, och detta ska vara våra gränser som militärt kan bygga upp runt omkring oss och har sagt väldigt tydligt, för det är väldigt viktigt att komma ihåg till exempel det palestinska fördraget, alltså det som är grunden för PLO, har ju inte på något sätt erkänt Israels existens ens. Och det ska bli din granne då. Då kan man förstå tveksamheten. Men gör israelerna några som helst fel idag? Situationen är ju mer komplicerad än någonsin och låsningen verkar enorm. Nya ja. dödsfall varenda dag i stort sett. Ja, kan du rikta någon kritik mot jo, men det? Självklart, Israel är inte en fullkomlig start och jag tror inte att någon tycker det. Jag tycker inte det, men, men det är inte det det handlar om. Alltså, människor gör fel. Det är en oerhört komplicerad och stressad situation. Övergrepp begås på båda sidor. Men man måste se djupare än så. Vad är det? Israelerna och Israel strider för det bilden, mediebilden, om jag får nu vara lite kritisk då. Det är ju detta att vi har eh, stora, stygga vargen i Israel med sina tanks och så har vi då de palestinska ungdomarna med sina eh, stenar. Men bilden är ju inte sån. Du har ju alltså eh, hela om hela arabvärlden, du har terroristorganisationer som arbetar medvetet för att Israel ska sluta existera. Det är det man strider mot. Man strider inte mot tonåringar i Gaza. Men kan du se då med Ja. att Israel lämnar ockuperat område ja, för alltså, att börja en process. Ja, ja, vi kan se poäng, men jag tror att man, man, det, det Barack gjorde till exempel, misstaget där, det var ju att han förhandlade inte färdigt. Man börjar inte med att säga, oh, okej, okay, vi, okay, vi släpper allting, får vi fred då? Man fick ju inte fred då. Och Arafat, som hade den bästa möjligheten någon eh, palestinsk ledare någonsin, någon arabledare någonsin har haft när Ehud Barak som premiärminister vill ge bort 98 procent av, av, av Västbanken, säger nej. Alltså det är makalöst. Fler frågor, Daniel? Har du fler, finns det fler politiska frågor på din agenda? Alltså det här är inte en politisk fråga, utan detta är en fråga som jag tror att det här är en allmänmänsklig fråga och det är också en fråga för, för kristna att förstå 
Israels plats. Men det får ju väldigt eh, politiska... Ja, vi lever i en politisk ja. värld. Ja. Vi gör ju det. Alltså, jag vänder mig emot, och det var ju debatten på 80-talet när, när en del av våra kära vänner i Uppsala eh, från den andra samfund sa att man får inte tala politik i predestolen, sa de. Och så talar de om vänsterpolitik hela tiden. Men om det kom från ett annat håll så fick man inte tala. Så det är klart att vi lever i en politisk värld. Det gör vi ju. Vi har ju till exempel i Sverige idag, tycker jag, väldigt, väldigt tveksam situation. Eh, när regeringen, när eh, utbildningsminister Österås, när Skolverket för en fullkomlig vendetta mot kristna skolor idag. Så det är klart att vi aldrig kan undgå politik. Det är ju utifrån ska vi säga, en, en internationell perspektiv så tror jag det inte finns något annat land förutom gamla öststater då, som inte accepterar konfessionella skol, friskolor. Det är en absurd situation. Det känns som det är någon slags frostiga gamla stalinister som upp igen och hojtar. Så visst finns det en politisk ton, men det menar jag det har med demokrati och frihet att göra. Eh, och det är också grundande, grundläggande också friheten för evangelium i det här landet. Evangeliet fram eh, överlevnad i Sverige. Jag har två snabba frågor, Ulf Ekman, till sist. Ja. Kan Gud vara kvinna? Ja, Gud har ju skapat man och kvinna. Gud är inte feminin, vare, vare sig grammatiskt eller teologiskt. Jag tror vad Jesus, när Jesus sa fader vår som är i himmelen, då menar han fader vår. Men det är ju inte, alltså, jag, vi kan inte införa ett slags jämlikhetsfeminist teologiskt mönster och radera bort alla ord i Bibeln där det står han och skriva hon istället och tror att det blir bättre. Men Gud inkluderar ju man och kvinna och i Kristus är man och kvinna jämställda. Det är ju väldigt betydelsefullt. Och kan man komma till himlen även om man inte tror på Gud? Eh, jag tror inte de som inte tror på Gud har något intresse av att komma till någon slags himmel. Jesus var ju väldigt klar på detta att det är genom honom som vägen till Gud går. Och jag tror först ska man titta på Jesus och lyssna på vad han säger. Bedöma hans erbjudande innan man spekulerar om annat. Om man nu talar om himmelen. Jag tror att vägen till himlen går genom Jesus Kristus. Tack Ulf Ekman för att du kom hit. Tack så mycket. Tack Daniel Gran. I Europa idag så lever vi i ett allt växande befolkningsunderskott där den åldrande befolkningsdelen ökar allt mer och nytillskott av arbetskraft är ett stort problem i Europa idag. Det är faktiskt skrämmande att tänka sig vad det betyder enbart för Europa att miljontals ofödda barn aldrig fick födas, aldrig växte upp. Aldrig fick vare sig möjligheten att kommunicera, relatera eller reproducera sig själva vidare i nya generationer. Enbart som arbetskraft är det en otrolig mängd människor som aldrig fick möjligheten att bidra till samhällsutveckling. Eftersom deras föräldrar med samhällets benägna och ibland tvingande bistånd förnekade dem möjligheten att födas och växa upp. Och det här är faktiskt ett moraliskt problem av katastrofala proportioner. Den stund som vi inser, som alla tidigare generationer alltid vetat om och tagit för absolut självklart, nämligen att det foster kvinnan bär på är en livslevande liten människa. Är ett barn som utvecklas och förbereds för livet. Då blir dödandet av detta barn med samhällets aktiva bistånd en moralisk avgrund. Att påstå att aborter är en rättighet är att helt vända upp och ner på begreppen. Det är att födas som en mänsklig rättighet. Lite tvärtom. Barnet. Barnet har en självklar rättighet att födas eftersom det redan finns till. Barnet är naturligtvis inte heller enbart en del av kvinnans kropp som hon därför skulle kunna förfoga över hur som helst. Barnet har ett eget liv, en egen personlighet och en egen utveckling som måste respekteras. Det minsta detta unika av Gud skapade barn kan begära det är att det ska få utvecklas i fred i mammas mage, utan att utsättas för faran att graviteten avbryts och livet utsläcks. Att försvara aborter, det vill säga utsläckande av barnens liv, med att man inte vill att barn ska vara oönskade, är att inte förstå vad livet egentligen är. 
I Guds ögon finns det inte ett enda oönskat barn. Att säga att en allvarlig sjukdom skapar dålig livskvalitet och därför ger skäl till att abortera är att inte förstå vad livet handlar om. Det är inte vi som bestämmer vad livskvalitet är. Och det finns nog inget barn hur sjukt den kan vara som inte skulle vilja leva vidare. Abortstatistiken är långt utöver vår fattningsförmåga. Jag ska inte dra en massa siffror här idag. I Sverige slutar var fjärde graviditet med abort. Och bland våra tonåringar så är, slutar fyra av fem graviditeter med abort. Över hela världen aborteras varje år mellan 40 till 60 miljoner barn. Det innebär att mellan en till två barn, och lyssna på det här, mellan ett eller två barn varje sekund aborteras. Varje minut, varje timme, varje dag, varje vecka, varje månad, hela året runt, år ut och år in. I snitt ett barn per sekund, minst, kanske två. Så detta, hur man än räknar och hur man än tänker, är den största mänskliga katastrof som har drabbat mänskligheten någonsin. På tio år blir det en halv miljard människor. Mer än vad som levde i hela världen på Jesu tid. Så proportionerna här är tsunamiaktiga. Och vad konsekvenserna kommer att bli, det är långt bortom vår egen fattningsförmåga. Jag tror inte vi kan välja och vraka när det gäller Jesu undervisning. Plocka vissa grejer som vi tycker är bra, andra saker som vi helst inte vill tala om. För att då, då blir det så försnävat och till slut så blir det ytligt. Och till slut så missuppfattar vi egentligen vad Jesus säger och vem han är. Och jag ska tala om en sak nu här som jag tror vi ibland skjuter undan. Men som har dykt upp i programmet idag. Och just därför så vill jag tala om det. Paulus han säger så här, var ivriga. Att bevara andens enhet, det här är i Fesebrevets fjärde kapitel och den tredje versen. Var ivrig att bevara andens enhet genom fridens band. En kropp och en ande. Liksom ni kallades till ett hopp, det som tillhör er kallelse. Här så betonar Paulus, eller betonar skriften, det är ju den heliga ande som inspirerat det här, betonar enheten och det är ju det vi har talat om lite med våra kära härliga katolska syskon. Eh, och det här är klart när det här slår ner lite grann uppe i Norrland och i Norge och i Småland och här hemma i Uppsala också så, så ibland blir ju, ju vi lite inte minst kanske karismatiker, karismatiker lite nervösa. Eh, och, och det tycker jag inte vi ska vara därför att skriften säger att vi ska inte frukta utan vi ska se, vad är det egentligen Jesus håller på med? Vad gör den heliga ande idag? Han gör mycket, han är kraftens ande. Men här står det också att han är enhetens ande. Bevara andens enhet står det. Eh, och jag tror att det finns någonting i oss. Jag tror det ligger i vårt kött som, som drar bort ifrån den här enheten. Det ligger ju i oss att vilja gå vår egen väg. Att insistera på att just jag har rätt. Och jag har rätt tolkning på Bibeln och jag vet vad som gäller eh, och det där ligger något eh, farligt i detta eller det ligger något ytligt i det och Jesus ber just för det här och Johannes i 17 kapitel så ber han på ett väldigt väldigt härligt sätt han ber så här, jag ber och det är om lärjungarna jag ber att de alla ska vara ett och det är otroligt radikalt om man tänker på det jag ber att de alla, alla lärjungar alla som följer Jesus, alla som tror på Jesus jag ber att de alla ska vara ett och att så som du fader är i mig och jag är i dig och det var en total enhet mellan fadern och sonen också de ska vara i oss för att världen ska tro att du har sänt mig och så fortsätter Jesus här. Och den härlighet som du har gett mig har jag gett dem för att de ska vara ett. Vi brukar ju tala om den heliga ande som härlighetens ande. Vi brukar ju tala om under och tecken som en manifestation av smörjelsen, härligheten. Men här säger Jesus att härligheten som vi har fått genom härlighetens ande, den finns där för att vi ska vara ett. Och varför ska vi vara ett? Jo, därför att världen ska förstå, förstå att fadern har sänt 
sonen och att Gud älskar oss var och en. Och därför så är den här enheten mer betydelsefull tror jag än vad vi anar eh, och att vi ibland snarare letar efter det som skiljer än det som förenar och det, det tror jag är fel väg att gå eh, mitt igenom det vi kulturellt sett kallar för kristenheten så går det ju linjer de som har mött Jesus de som verkligen tror på Jesus de som eh, ärar Guds ord och läser Guds ord och de som eh, har upplevt en helig ande. Det här är saker som förenar idag rakt genom alla samfund. Du har människor i alla sammanhang idag som är för eller emot de här sakerna. Och det är ett verk av den heliga ande som drar människor nu från väldigt många olika sammanhang. Så jag tror att vi måste börja titta på varandra som syskon och bekänna att vi har en andlig enhet, att det finns en grundläggande andens enhet som redan finns och som vi måste så att säga, upptäcka och bekänna oss till. Det andra är att det finns ett hjärtats enhet, vilket innebär att eh, mitt hjärta måste öppnas mot syskon. Du kanske sitter och är baptist och inte tycker om pingstvänner. Du kanske är metodist och inte tycker om lutheraner. Och du kanske är lutheran och inte tycker om katoliker. Och jag menar, vi har ju så mycket av detta. Och vi har den här kända protestantiska splittringen som, som finns med eh, över 35 000 olika samfundorganisationer på protestantisk mark där vi alla tycker att ja, vi har rätt. Eh, nu är det ju lite bättre än så därför att det finns ju en grundläggande ström av, av, av att upptäcka varandra och faktiskt älska varandra. Och just hjärtas enhet. Jag har fått uppleva det här själv de senaste tio åren inte minst. Att om mitt hjärta är upp och jag kan lyssna på andra så helt plötsligt så känner jag att men det här är min broder eh, och det här är min syster. Eh, de kanske beter sig kulturellt, de kanske beter sig eh, traditionellt lite annorlunda vad jag gör. Men om jag vågar öppna mitt hjärta så eh, kan jag helt plötsligt eh, få någonting också, vara med och bidra någonting och så kommer vi vara närmare. Sen finns det tror jag också en eh, strategisk enhet. Det finns saker som vi oavsett vilken bakgrund du har, vilket sammanhang vi står i, kan enas om. Till exempel ja till livet. Till exempel emot abort. Andra frågor, viktiga eh, gränsöverskridande frågor och mycket annat också. Evangelisation och så vidare. Och det här tror jag leder steg för steg naturligtvis till en, en också tydligare mer synlig enhet mellan oss som troende. Därför varenda gång jag har evangeliserat och personligen vittnat för någon så kommer nästan alltid utan undantag den här frågan. Men ni kristna, hur kan ni tala till oss? Ni är ju själva så splittrade. Ni kommer inte ens överens med varandra. Varför ska vi haka på det här? Så därför så tror jag, och en bror som heter Charles Whitehead har en lista. Jag ska hinna inte läsa hela den. Men han säger en del bra saker. Han säger vi måste acceptera varandra som syskon och bröder. Vi måste bejaka att vi har skillnader. Men att de inte behöver vara murar mellan oss. Vi måste vara trogna mot vilka vi själva är och tacksamma för den, det sammanhang vi står i. Men vi måste se att det finns mer som förenar än som skiljer. Och lära sig att lyssna. Lyssna på varandra, lära sig av varandra och faktiskt se att själva splittring är en skandal. Icke-kristna talar mer om den, förstår den mer än vad vi ofta gör. Och vi måste eh, bekänna den tror jag som synd inför Herren. Och sen inse att det kostar det här med enhet att sträcka ut handen till någon i ett annat sammanhang. Det gör att du får kritik på dig direkt. Andra människor blir arga och irriterade och det kan inte vi bry oss om. Utan vi måste göra så mycket vi bara kan för att stå tillsammans och, och tacka Gud för varandra. Och så komma ihåg djupast sett att det är fadern, sonen, som vill den här enheten och som vill verka den här enheten i den heliga ande. Dr. Hovind taught science for 15 years. Then he got his PhD in education. He's always had a love for teaching. But one thing that he's discovered is that in many of the science textbooks across America today, there are some fallacies, some false information being presented. Why is this information in the science textbooks? What are they trying to prove? Hi, my name is Eric. And in this seminar called Lies in the Textbooks, you're going to find out some of those lies that are being presented and what you can do about it. Welcome to our seminar on lies in the textbooks. My name is Kent Hovind. I taught high school science for 15 years. 
And now for, well, since 1989, I've been doing seminars on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. And our goal is to strengthen your faith in God's Word. Now, this is not my wife. That's just a picture of her. We live in Pensacola, Florida. Been there 16 years. Have three children, one of each. And I got them all married, and the dog died. Praise God, so I'm home free. And as we mentioned earlier, we have four grandkids so far, and that's God's reward for not killing your own kids when you thought about it. So we got a whole tribe, and they all live right around me, and all work in our ministry. A real blessing to all have them right there. God's given us an amazing staff of people at Creation Science Evangelism. Our purpose is to get people saved. Okay? We like science at our place. We have Dinosaur Adventure Land. We have a science center, a theme park, and a museum, all kinds of cool science stuff. Some people try to say, well, you Christians are against science. No, 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 I like science. I'm against evolution because it's not part of science. Evolution's a lie, okay? There's no scientific evidence to back up evolution. We'll get into that in just a minute. The Bible says in the Ten Commandments, Thou shalt not bear false witness. Don't lie. Proverbs says, A false witness shall not be unpunished. He that speaketh lies shall not escape. God hates liars. The Bible says they delight in lies. Okay? These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A lying tongue, then a couple of verses later, a false witness that speaketh lies. Out of the seven things God hates, two of them are liars. <laughs> he must really hate them. He lists them in there twice. Okay? Jesus said, You have your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he's a liar, and the father of it. Now, I like science, and I collect public school textbooks. I have hundreds of them from many, many countries, from clear back from 1880, I believe, to 2005, textbooks. I'm not against science. We happen to really like the subject. We have all kinds of cool science displays at our museum and our science center, and you can come down and visit Dinosaur Adventure Land and see for yourself. I am, however, against lying to kids. Now, in the first three videos, we talked about how students are being lied to about the Big Bang. It didn't happen. They're being lied to about the age of the Earth. It is not billions of years old. They're being lied to about the cavemen. There's never been a caveman, unless you mean Osama bin Laden. Okay? <laughs> They're being lied to about the dinosaurs. They did not live millions of years ago. Now, here we're going to cover about 30 more lies in the textbooks. There are hundreds we could go through. We're going to try to hit the highlights, and this could go for days just covering lies in our textbooks. I'm going to hit some of the big ones, leave some of the little ones go for another time when we have more time. I am not trying to get evolution out of the public schools. I'm not. I think any theory should be allowed to be taught if you don't have to lie to support your theory with false evidence, okay? I am not trying to get creation into the schools. And I think Christians that work on either one of those are wasting their time. And many people have wasted hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to accomplish those two goals. It's futile. It's not going to happen. I am, however, trying to get lies out of the textbooks. I think we'll find if we take the lies out of the books, there's nothing left to support evolution. Well, that's their problem. They shouldn't have picked such a dumb theory to begin with, okay? It's not my fault, okay? Now, I'm not against teachers. My mother was a godly woman, led my dad to the Lord on their first date. She retired from teaching public school years ago. Been in heaven now for about seven years. My brother led me to the Lord. He just retired last year from teaching public school after 34 years. There are many good godly teachers in the system. There are many good godly principals, many good godly school board members. I'm not against schools. I'm not against school boards. I'm not against teachers. I'm not against textbooks. I'm against lies. Okay, let's just keep it in perspective. Is there anybody here that thinks te teachers or textbooks should be allowed to deliberately lie to students for any reason? And I mean deliberately. They might be lying and not know they're lying. Okay, but if they're deliberately lying, that shouldn't be allowed, should it? Okay? Wisconsin has a law that requires textbooks to be accurate. So does Alabama. Textbooks shall be adequate and current, up to date. Okay? The latest information. Texas has a law that says, instructional material shall be factual. Go Texas. Okay? Florida has a law that requires accuracy of instructional materials, and the commissioner is responsible to remove books that are not accurate. Well, commissioner, do your job. Okay? Watch this video and remove the books that are not accurate. It's so simple. It's so simple, okay? California says textbooks shall be factually accurate and reflect uh, current and confirmed research, okay? Minnesota says a teacher shall not deliberately suppress or distort subject matter. Yeah, sure, hey there, fella. You betcha. 
The problem is none of those states enforce their own laws. I don't know if Tennessee here has a law that requires textbook accuracy. They ought to if they don't have one. If you don't have one, pass one. This is a textbook from about 100 years ago. It says, God created the heavens and the earth in six days. Hmm. Prayer is a duty, but it's vain to pray without a sincere desire of heart. God governs the world in infinite wisdom. you believe that's a public school textbook? Well, here's one today. Evolution is fact, not theory. Birds arose from non-birds and humans from non-humans. No person who pretends to any understanding of the natural world can deny these facts. Wow, something's changed. Actually, I was at uh, Chickasaw, uh, Oklahoma a couple of weeks ago. Did it, it was supposed to be a debate, but none of the professors would debate me. So they scheduled an evolution seminar two days after I was gone. They let me come speak on creation. The, the student group got me in there. Here's a poster they put up right next to my poster. Uh, the poster was inviting people to come to the evolution seminar. Interested in evolution? Well, come on down. Evolution lecture with Dr. Mather and Dr. Ray. It says, hear both sides of the issue. <laughs> well, we invited them to debate. They could have heard both sides altogether. Here the kids get nine months of evolution teaching. I come in for two hours and they panic. And then they got to say, hear both sides. Both sides. You're not going to present both sides. You're going to present one side the evolution side, which is what they already got for nine months. They don't want to hear it. <laughs> I think they said 20 people turned up, 15 of them are from the Baptist Student Union, just to see what the teachers would say. Okay. They hear both sides. Their own textbook there in Chickasaw, Oklahoma, has one quarter of the book, one entire unit, devoted only to evolution teaching. Nothing about creation. Evolution is a dying religion surviving only on tax dollars. It's dead. This textbook has over 100 pages where evolution is talked about. There's not one single mention of creation. So don't tell me they want to hear both sides. They don't, okay? They want to present one view only. It's called indoctrination, not education. Now this is a chart showing how the atheists feel that the different states are doing with the teaching of evolution. They think you folks in Tennessee are doing a lousy job of teaching evolution to your kids. Go, Tennessee. All right. Hey, hey. Okay. <laughs> they think the folks right over here in North Carolina are doing a good job of teaching evolution. Well, North Carolina folks, get on the ball. Turn your state red by the next time they do this survey, okay? Now, is there anybody here that thinks te teachers or textbooks should be allowed to use outdated or false information just to get students to believe a theory? Would that be a good idea? No, okay? Anybody here that thinks teachers that deliberately lie should be fired? Okay. Is there anybody here that thinks textbooks with lies should be banned or the lies torn out of the book? Think that'd be fair? All right. Well, buckle up, hang on, let's go. It's always amazed me how two people can look at the same thing and come to opposite conclusions of what they are looking at. You know, two people can look at Grand Canyon. One of them believes in evolution. He looks at the canyon and says, wow, look what the Colorado River did for millions and millions of years. The Bible believing Christian stands there, looks at the same canyon, and says, wow, look what the flood did in about 30 minutes. Now, how was that canyon formed, huh? Textbook says, over millions of years, the Colorado River formed the Grand, carved the Grand Canyon from solid rock. Oh, now, hold on a second, okay? It's a fact Grand Canyon exists. I've been there a bunch of times, studied, I taught her science for 15 years. I love studying Grand Canyon. There are two interpretations of how it got there. The evolutionists will say it formed slowly with a little bit of water and lots of time, like, you know, billions of years. The creationists will say, no, it formed quickly by lots of water and a little bit of time, like a big flood in the days of Noah. And the guys who believe in evolution are always trying to erase the line between their interpretation and try to include it as if it is part of the fact. <laughs> no, no, it's just your interpretation, guys, okay? This textbook says, the Colorado River has cut through layer upon layer of rock over millions of years. Well, now, hold on a minute. This textbook says, the Colorado River cut through 2,000 meters of rock, exposing sediment layers like huge pages in the Book of Life. Scan the canyon wall from rim to floor, and you look back through hundreds of millions of years. I don't think so. I was in a debate one time, and this atheist said, Hovind, you're so stupid. Don't you know it took millions of years to carve the Grand Canyon? I said, well, sir, there's a couple things you ought to learn about Grand Canyon. If you built a dam across Grand Canyon, a huge lake would fill in behind it, covering several states, okay? I mean, it'd take a lot of dirt to build a dam, but if you could build a dam across that canyon, you'd have a really big lake. 
Actually, some of the water from Wyoming drains through the Grand Canyon. It has a huge drainage pattern. Here's a picture of it, satellite false color uh, image. You can see Grand Canyon right there, a big gash right across a ridge in the mountains. You folks in Tennessee know what a ridge is. Not really a mountain, just a big long ridge, okay? I've flown by and taken lots of pictures. I asked the pilot one time, I was going, going, I said, man, are we going near Grand Canyon? He said, yeah, about 100 miles. I said, can you uh, get permission to, you know, divert and go closer? He said, ah, uh, let me see what I can do. He got permission, we flew right over the top of the canyon. I'm tsh, tsh, taking pictures like crazy, you know. Love studying Grand Canyon. Actually, it's a bunch of useless real estate. I mean, what would you do with it if you had it, you know? You can look at it and then go home, that's about it. But, I mean, you can't plow it, that's for sure, and you don't want your cows playing out there. But I said to this professor, I said, sir, there's a couple things to consider about this canyon. I said, these two red lines indicate what's called the snow line, okay? Between those two red lines is a ridge that gets about uh, 6,900 to 8,500 feet above sea level. Now, the river enters the canyon at the far right over there at 2,800 foot elevation. The river flows downhill for 270 miles, comes out the other side. If you look at it from a side view, a schematic view, it'll look like this. The river comes in 2,800 foot elevation. The ground rises up while the river goes down for 270 miles. I said, now, sir, there's a few things you ought to consider about this canyon. I said, did you know the top of Grand Canyon is higher than the bottom? He said, obviously. I said, sir, did you know the river only runs through the bottom? He said, well, yeah. I said, sir, did you know the top is higher than where the river enters the canyon by over 4,000 feet? He got a dazed look on his face like a calf looking at a new gate. I said, sir, did you know rivers don't flow uphill in Tennessee? <laughs> There's no delta. Where's the mud that washed out of Grand Canyon? Nobody has a clue, okay? That river did not make that canyon. Grand Canyon's a washed out spillway. There used to be two big lakes, Grand Lake and Hopi Lake. The lakes are long gone, but the beaches are still there. You can still see the beach line. They got too full and went over the top and washed out that canyon in a hurry. Any farmer that's ever built a dam to hold water for his cows will tell you, once the water goes over the top of the dam, it's all over with. That's why they guard the levee like crazy during flood seasons, don't they? Get out there with sandbags. You don't want it to even get started. It's gone in a flash, okay? This river flows down this, this way. Obviously, it started at the top. It must have been a big lake backed up there, too. Even El Paso, Texas is called El Paso because it's the pass, okay? I bet there used to be a big lake backed up behind El Paso that dried up and left the white sands of New Mexico behind. That's another long, interesting story. But if you look at Grand Canyon, it's pretty obvious it's a washed-out spillway, okay? Almost all rivers around the world come together at what's called acute angles, less than 90 degrees. I mean, the rivers merge and keep going the same, you know, general direction. If you look at Grand Canyon, the rivers on the lower left are indeed merging at l acute angles, less than 90 degrees. But if you look at the upper right, the rivers are flowing backwards. Why would they do that? The rivers run backwards, hit the main channel, turn around, and come back out the other way. It's called a barbed canyon. There aren't many places like this on the planet. Well, this is evidence that a lake is draining, and as the water's running off the spillway backwards into the channel, it turns around, or off the dam, water runs off the dam into the low place, turns around, and comes back out through the crack, through the breach in the dam. Grand Canyon was not made by the Colorado River over millions of years. That is one of the lies you kids are going to face in your textbook. It's just not geophysically possible for that to happen. Now, are there any farmers or vets in the crowd that might know what this machine is? What is that, brother? That's a calf puller. That's a what? A calf puller. Mm -hmm. Once in a while, a cow has a hard time having that baby calf, and so they get the calf puller out, tie the cable around the calf's legs, and <coughs> jack the calf out of the cow. You get a few tons of pressure on there, calf comes right out, no problem. Well, one day, this farmer was out pulling a calf. It was a breech birth. The back feet are coming out first. That's not good, but you know, it happens once in a while. So the farmer had the calf puller out there, and he's <coughs> trying to pull the calf out of the cow. And a city fellow stopped his car to see what on earth is going on. And the farmer said, have you ever seen anything like this before? The city fellow said, I have never seen nothing like this. The farmer said, do you have any questions? The city fellow said, yes, sir, I have one question. It's been bugging me for 10 minutes. The farmer said, well, uh, what's your question? And the city fellow said, how fast do you figure that calf was going when it ran into that cow? 
No, 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 no. We're not separating the wreck here, fellas. You know, it's possible for two people to be looking at the same thing, and one of them is getting the wrong idea of what he's looking at. The Bible warned us that was going to happen. Knowing this first, there shall come in the last days scoffers. Did you know there are people that scoff at the Bible? I deal with them on a regular basis. I attract them like a lightning rod. They scoff, it says, because of their lust. There's no scientific reason for them to reject the Bible. They just don't like that book because it chaps their hide. So they're scoffing because of their lust, not because of their science, okay? Even Huxley admitted, I suppose the reason we leapt at origin of species was that the idea of God interfered with our sexual mores. Uh, we don't want God telling us what to do, okay? Arthur Keith said, evolution is unproved and unprovable. We believe it because the only alternative is special creation, and that is unthinkable. The Bible says they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. Anybody that believes they evolved from a rock 4.6 billion years ago, I would say is strongly deluded. You would have to have help to be that dumb. You could not do it on your own. You'd have to have years of training and conditioning to believe such a silly idea. Hey, is it possible for a person to go insane? I mean, absolutely loony. Oh, yeah, it happens, doesn't it? Okay. Is it possible for an entire group of people to go insane? Can you imagine over 900 people drinking poison Kool-Aid and killing themselves? A whole group went insane. Is it possible for an entire nation to go insane? You know, like millions and millions of people go just plain old nuts? Oh, it's happened, folks. Hey, is it possible for the entire world to go insane? Well, the Bible says, The great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. I think we're living in a time when just about the whole world has gone nuts. They believe they come from a rock 4.6 billion years ago. How dumb can you get? Second Peter goes on to say, Where is the promise of his coming? That's what the scoffers are going to say. For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. That's an important phrase. The scoffers are going to say, The way things are happening now is the way they've always been happening. Long, slow, gradual processes. Hmm. The Bible says the scoffers are willingly ignorant. Willingly ignorant. In the Greek, that means dumb on purpose. Mm -hmm. They're willingly ignorant of how God made the heavens and the earth, and they're ignorant of the flood. The world was overflowed with water and perished. We cover more on that on videotape number two of our series. But one of the scoffers in the last days was a guy named James Hutton. Now, James Hutton lived in the late 1700s. James wrote a book and said, the earth is millions of years old. Now, you need to understand, in the late 1700s, most people believed the Bible, or at least they were strongly influenced by Christianity, and everybody thought the earth was about 6,000 years old. That was the common teaching of the day, okay? They taught the kids in the public school, you know, God created the world in six days, like we saw earlier. But this was also a time of many revolutions. We had the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Polish, the Spanish, the German. Every country is just about revolting against the idea of a king and establishing a democracy. So they threw off monarchy, and this is known as, as the age of anti-monarchy. So the Bible says to honor the king, and some people thought the Bible was an obstacle to their political objectives. And they wanted to discredit the Bible. Keep in mind, this all happened in the early, early 1800s and late 1700s. So back when everybody thought the earth was a few thousand years old, James Hutton came along and said, oh, no, it's lots older than that. And it got here by uniformitarianism. Ooh, kids, big word, bold print. That'll be on the test. They always are, okay? Uniformitarianism means the present is the key to the past. No, James, I think the Bible's the only perfect key to the past. But there, during this time frame, the Christians, instead of fighting against this new teaching of millions of years, they swallowed it. The Christians accepted the idea of a gap theory or day-age theory or progressive creation. They just accepted millions of years right into the Bible when it's obvious to anybody with half a brain and one eye reading the Bible that it does not teach the earth is millions of years old. That's not what it says. So the Christians did not put up an effective defense, an effective uh, resistance to this teaching, and they allowed the church to believe all this. And then when evolution came out, 1859 became popular with Darwin's book, while well, the Christians just accepted that too. 
Boy, what a tragedy. That book covers the great turning point in history, if you've got like the history of stuff. Well, James Hutton's book that he wrote had a real strong influence on a young lawyer from Scotland named Charles Lyell. Charles Lyell, the lawyer, hated the Bible. Somebody calculated one time that if all the lawyers in the world were laid end to end around the equator, we would all be better off. <laughs> Charles Lyell, in 1830, wrote this book right here, Principles of Geology. I've got it here on the table. You can come take a look at it. It's all marked up. In this book, you can see his hatred for the Bible kind of ooze off every page. He kept calling it ancient doctrines. He said, oh, you have a scriptural authority. He was mocking them, okay? He called it a religious prejudice. He said, men of superior talent, oh, he's talking about himself, who thought for themselves and were not blinded by authority, he used every opportunity he could find to mock the scriptures. And kids, you won't have to go to college very far before you're going to run into a professor that has this mocking attitude toward God's word. How many of you had one when you went through school? Seems like their whole goal in life is to destroy your faith. I had a bunch of them when I went to school. <laughs> they just want to destroy your confidence. Well, Charles said his goal was to free the science from Moses. What do you suppose he meant by that? Well, before Charles Lyell wrote his book, everybody looked at the geology, looked at Grand Canyon and said, wow, look at the flood did. He didn't like people interpreting Earth's history in light of the Bible. He wanted them to interpret Earth's history in terms of millions of years. Lyell is the primary guy responsible for inventing what today is known as the geologic column. How many have ever heard of the geologic column before? They divided the Earth up into layers and gave them names, you know. Uh, Cenozoic, Mesozoic, Paleozoic, Archaeozoic, all that kind of stuff. Maybe you saw the movie Jurassic Park, named after the Jurassic layer, okay? Each layer of rock was given a name and an age and an index fossil. Now keep in mind, all this was done in 1830 before there ever was a carbon dating, potassium argon dating, rubidium strontium dating, lead 208, lead 206, uranium 235, uranium 238. None of those had even been thought of. So they didn't determine these great ages by any radiometric metric decay method. They just picked the numbers out of the clear blue sky. It's a fact the earth has many layers of sedimentary rock. That is just a fact. You can see them all over Tennessee here. How'd they get there? Well, there are two interpretations. One group says the layers formed slowly over millions of years. The other group says, no, these layers are all from the flood in the days of Noah. And again, they're always trying to erase that line between the two and make their interpretation become part of the fact. And it's just not, okay? It's just their interpretation, that's all. The geologic column is actually the Bible for the evolutionist. The only place you'll ever find it is in the textbooks. It doesn't exist. This guy admits it. He said, if there were a column of sediments, uh, unfortunately, no such column exists. Did you know there is no geologic column? If there was, it'd be 100 miles thick. It doesn't exist. It's one of the lies in the textbooks. And actually, all of evolution is based on this lie right here. This is one of the most serious ones, in my opinion. It's true the Earth has layers. That's not the question. Okay? How did they get there, though? I mean, if that layer sat there for 10 million years waiting for the next one, don't you think it's going to rain once in a while in 10 million years? Why are there no erosion marks between the layers? Why are they stacked on top of each other just like a stack of pancakes? Hmm? And by the way, why are there no soil layers between the rock layers? I mean, soil builds up on top of rock. Don't you think there'd be some soil built up once in a while? Hmm? Look, if you get a jar of dirt and rocks and gravel and sand and mud and shake it up and set it down, it settles into layers for you in a few minutes. It doesn't take long. How many have seen those things you buy at the mall with two pieces of glass and different colored sand in between? You know, you flip it over and it makes all kinds of layers just in a few seconds. It doesn't take long. I was preaching years ago in Union Center, South Dakota. Now, Union Center is right there. It's not even on the map. And South Dakota puts everything they can find on the map just to kind of fill in the white places, you know. Well, there were 40 people in the whole town. 38 of them came to church. The other two must have been pulling a calf, I reckon. I don't know. But boy, we had a great meeting, and the preacher said, Hey, Hovind, let's go down to Rapid City. They've got a bunch of dinosaurs in the museum there. I said, All right, I like dinosaurs. Let's go. So we all drove down to Rapid City. We came to this museum, and a guide met us at the door. He said, Hey, folks, would you like me to give you a tour? We said, That would be great, sir. Well, the first place we stopped on the tour was the geologic time chart. They have it lit up, and it's behind glass, and it's holy and sacred. Don't dare touch that thing, you know. 
So we're standing over there, and the guide said, Now, folks, this layer of rock right here is about 70 million years old. And it's so cool, because they always get that sanctimonious tone in their voice, you know. 70 million years old. Oh. <laughs> well, my daughter was 12 years old at the time. She raised her hand. She said, Mr., how do you know that layer is 70 million years old? He said, honey, that's a good question. We tell the age of the layers by what types of fossils we find in them. They're called index fossils. And by the way, that's correct. That's what the textbook says. Scientists use index fossils to determine the age of rock layers. She said, thank you, sir. We walked around the other side. We're standing over here, and the guide said, now, folks, these bones are about 100 million years old. My daughter raised her hand again. She said, sir, how do you know those bones are 100 million years old? He said, well, honey, we tell the age of the bones by which layer they came from. She said, uh, sir, when we were standing over there, you told me you knew the age of the layers by the bones, and now you're telling me you know the age of the bones by the layers. She said, isn't that circular reasoning? I thought, wow, a chip off the old block. <laughs> that guy had the strangest look on his face. It was almost as if he were thinking. He looked at my daughter, he looked at me, I wasn't about to help him. I thought, wow, this is going to be good. I have got to hear this. He looked back at my daughter, he said, wow, you're right, that is circular reasoning. He said, I never thought of that before. That fellow drove 50 miles one way that night to, hear me come, to come hear me speak in Union Center, South Dakota. The crowd swelled to 39. We set up a chair in the aisle. Afterwards, he talked to me for an hour. He said, Hovind, is everything I believe about geology wrong? I teach this stuff at the college. I said, oh, no, 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 I like geology. I've got a huge fossil collection, rock collection, mineral collection. I teach earth science. I love studying geology. I said, but as far as the layers being different ages, I said, yes, sir, I'm sorry. That is all baloney. It's based on circular reasoning. I'll show you. Here's a textbook that tells the kids to date the rocks by the fossils, and on the very next page, it says date the fossils by the rocks. On the next page, and they don't catch it. It's a lie. It's circular reasoning. The intelligent layman has long suspected circular reasoning in the use of rocks to date fossils and fossils to date rocks. The geologist has never bothered to think of a good reply, feeling the explanations are not worth the trouble as long as the work brings results. Hmm. It cannot be denied from a strictly philosophical standpoint, geologists are arguing in a circle. The relative ages of rocks are determined by the organisms they contain. They, they date the rocks by the fossils and the fossils by the rocks. Ever since the beginning of the 19th century, Fossils have been and still are the best and most accurate method of dating and correlating the rocks in which they occur. Apart from very modern examples, which really are archaeology, I can think of no cases of radioactive decay being used to date fossils. They don't date fossils by potassium argon dating or carbon dating. That's not how they do it. Radiometric dating would not even be possible if the geologic column had not been erected first. There's no way to simply to look at a fossil and say how old it is unless you know the age of the rocks it comes from. This is Niles Eldridge, one of the most famous evolutionists alive today. He said, and this poses something of a problem. Yeah, something poses a big problem, Niles. If we date the rocks by the fossils, how can we then turn around and talk about patterns of evolutionary change through time in the fossil record? Circular reasoning. This guy said, the rocks do date the fossils, but the fossils date the rocks more accurately. <laughs> I think the cheese done fell out of his sandwich. That's what I think. Okay, he's... He's a few fries short of a Happy Meal. Mm -hmm. It's based on circular reasoning, okay? This guy said the charge of circular reasoning can be handled several ways. It can be ignored is not the proper concern of the public. It can be denied by calling down the law of evolution. It can be admitted as a common practice or avoided by pragmatic reasoning. But it is all based on circular reasoning. Actually, at the Scopes Monkey Trial, 1925, over here in Dayton, Tennessee. How far is Dayton from here, Steve? About 100 miles. 100 miles, okay. This is what they were going to use as evidence for evolution. The lowest layers are obviously the oldest. Page 275 of the court transcript. No, the oldest layers are not obviously the oldest. Did you know in still water, sediment layers settle out the bottom one first, and then the second one, and then the third one. That's correct. But in moving water, you can get five or six or ten layers to form simultaneously. They form from one end and travel across. So it's possible to have a fossil on the bottom that is younger than a fossil on top if it's moving water. 
There's a great video tape called Experiments in Stratification. It covers all that if you want more on that. Or get our video number six. We'll get more of that later. I like to ask evolutionists. I say, guys, your geologic column contains limestone uh, quite a few places. If I handed you a piece of limestone, how would you know if it's 100 million year old Jurassic limestone or 600 million year old Cambrian limestone? I mean, exactly what's the difference? They'd say, well, the only way to tell the difference is by the index fossils. Uh, that's precisely my point. They date the layers by the fossils. This textbook shows the kids a trilobite. And it says, boys and girls, trilobites make good index fossils. If a trilobite is found in a rock layer, the rock layer probably formed 500 to 600 million years ago. I don't think so. Somebody found a human shoe print where the guy with a shoe on had stepped on and smashed a trilobite. They asked evolutionists all over, how on earth could a human step on a trilobite? If trilobites lived 500 million years ago and man didn't get here till, you know, 3 million years ago and they didn't start, didn't start wearing shoes till 10,000 years ago, how could a human step on a trilobite? One atheist said, well, it's obviously. The uh, only un answer would be that uh, aliens visited the planet 500 million years ago. <laughs> oh, them aliens will do it every time. <laughs> Another guy said, well, maybe there was a large trilobite shaped like a shoe that fell on a small one. Now, there are some big trilobites, okay, but I don't think they're shaped like a shoe. Actually, the trilobite has the most complicated eyeball ever. Trilobite eyes are unbelievable. And this is one of the first creatures to evolve, and it already has the most complex eye, which it, just the eye is one of the most complex features you could have. Now, trilobites are not index fossils for anything, okay? There are all kinds of different types of trilobites, and there probably are some still alive today. Certainly, the Baltic isopod is still alive. A guy sent me a couple weeks ago, about a couple months ago, I guess, a whole jar full of trilobites from the Prudhoe Bay uh, treatment, water treatment plant up there for the oil uh, um, factory they've got, oil refining uh, rig. When they arrived in Pensacola, Florida, they were still alive in the jar. But I don't know how to keep a trilobite alive. I mean, you know, you give it mouth to what, you know, some resuscitation, but they all died, but we got them in our museum there. Somebody just sent me a large one that they got down in the Caribbean, about this big, it's in our museum, and it's, it was frozen. They said, yeah, I pulled it off the rock myself down in the Caribbean, still alive. They call it some kind of roach. Roach, it looks like a big trilobite. This textbook shows the kids a graptolite. It says, boys and girls, this is 410 million years old. I don't think so. Graptolites were found still alive in the South Pacific 10 years ago. So if you find graptolite, you can't use that as an index fossil for any age rock, okay? They tell the kids in school the lobe-finned fish is the index fossil for Devonian, 325 million years old. See that short leg, boys and girls? He's got a little bitty leg and then the fin. Ah, see, that proves he's evolving from a leg to a fin. No, that's a lie. The lobe-finned fish are still alive today. They're swimming around the Indian Ocean. And when they caught the first one in 1938, the scientists looked at it and said, wow, would you look at that? They survived for 325 million years. <laughs> it never dawned on them once to question the geologic column. That thought never crossed their brain. You don't question the geologic column. It is holy and sacred. You just have to say it survived for 325 million years. It's in the textbooks today. And they still say it's the index fossil for 325 million year old rock, even though they know they're swimming around the ocean. How can they be that dumb? This lady wrote a book about it, A Fish Caught in Time. She says, boys and girls, this is our own great uncle, 40 million times removed. She does look a little fishy, you know, kind of around the gills there. Okay. <laughs> You're going to be told that dinosaurs are index fossils for the Jurassic period, 70 million, or Cretaceous, 70 million years ago. That's baloney. Dinosaur bones were found here recently that had blood cells still in them. How long are the blood cells going to last? Here's soft tissue found with dinosaur bones. Still flexible, soft tissue in March of 2005. Here's fossilized human hands found in the same rock strata as dinosaur bones. Now, they tell you the layers are different ages. That's simply baloney, okay? Now, Charlie Darwin didn't like round numbers, so he said the Weldon deposits are 306,662,400 years old. <laughs> oh, how could he possibly know such a thing, okay? All over the world, petrified trees are found standing up, connecting these different rock layers. Petrified trees standing up. Now, how long does a dead tree stand up around here before it falls down? 
Hmm, five years, maybe ten years? Five million? Oh, no, not five million, that's for sure, right? But yet petrified trees in the vertical position are found all over the planet. I'll just flash through some pictures real quick here. There are all kinds of petrified trees found standing up. And they're running through multiple layers, and the kids are being taught the layers are different ages, and yet here's one tree connecting them all. I'm having a hard time believing these layers are different ages. That's what I'm having. Central Alabama's got a large coal mine with a whole bunch of petrified trees standing up running through two seams of coal, the Blue Creek and the Mary Lee. Now, they're going to tell you in school, for coal to form, a forest has to grow, and then it all falls over and turns into a swamp, and then it gets buried, and then new mud washes in on top, and the coal slowly, or coal slowly forms from the forest that was buried. And then thousands of years later, another forest grows on top, and a whole new layer of coal form. So if you find two layers of coal, oh, that took thousands of years. That's what they'll tell you in school. That's simply baloney. We'll cover more on coal formation on video six, but if you look at the samples of trees found in this coal mine, you look at sample A, B, C, D, E, F, G, I mean, any freshman law student could tell you, hey, folks, I think I can prove these two coal formations formed at the same time, very quickly, within a few weeks or months of each other, that's for sure, probably during the flood in the days of Noah. We'll cover more on that on video six. In Cookville, Tennessee, how far is Cookville from here? 100 miles? What's that? 150 miles. In Cookville, Tennessee, there's a coal mine with petrified trees standing, running. Here's coal at the bottom. The tree is coalified at the bottom, petrified in the middle, and coalified on top, where it went through a second coal seam. Same tree. By the way, why are coal seams generally found on top of layers of rock or clay? Wouldn't it uh, be a pretty poor place to grow a forest? Ought to be on top of soil, don't you think? Yeah. Polystrate fossils are found all over the world. In uh, no Joggins, Nova Scotia, there are dozens of petrified trees standing up, connecting different rock layers. People, scientists go up there and look at them and just say, wow, that's, that's curious. <laughs> no, it's more than curious. It's devastating to your teaching that the layers are different ages. There's a brochure you can get from our uh, bookstore. It's $2. It's got 30-some pictures of color pictures of petrified trees in the vertical position. Occasionally, the petrified trees are found upside down running through many rock layers. Now we really got a problem. I've thought about this till my brain hurts. The evolutionists have two ways to solve this. They can say, well, Hoven, you know, the trees stood upright for millions of years while the layers formed around them. Or the trees grew through hundreds of feet of solid rock looking for sunlight. Uh, there's a third way to look at it. You know, maybe they were all buried in a big flood. Mm -hmm. How fast was that calf going? Keep that thought in mind, okay? Mount St. Helens blew thousands of trees into Spirit Lake. Lots of those trees are stuck in the mud at the bottom of Spirit Lake. They're going to petrify in the standing position. More on video six about that. It doesn't take long for things to petrify. Here's petrified firewood. The guy chopped on it before it turned to stone. There's mummified dog stuck in a tree. Turned to stone. They chased a coon up the tree, apparently, and got stuck. They named it Stucky. What would you call it? Okay. Here's a petrified cowboy boot with the cowboy's leg still in it. The boot was made in 1950, and the leg is turned to stone. Here's petrified fish giving birth. It does not take millions of years to give birth. Praise God, okay? Here's a petrified hat. Petrified pickle found in a jar. The guy sent me the jar and pickle. He said, Brother Hovind, I found this in Montana in an old home. The house was you know, junk. The roof was gone. The house was falling apart. But he said, you want a petrified pickle for your museum? I said, of course, who in their right mind would not want a petrified pickle, you know? <laughs> Come on down to Pensacola and Dinosaur Adventure Land and see the petrified pickle. Here's petrified sacks of flour found in a uh, flour mill that flooded in 1910 in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. Here's petrified toadstool. There's an amazing gem and mineral museum just south of Bloomington, Illinois, in the little bitty tiny town called Shirley, Illinois. You've got to be trying to find it to get there, but it's worth going to see the funk gem and... Uh, Mineral Museum, okay? Here's petrified acorns. This kid sent them to me. He said, Brother Hovind, I was, I was seven years old at the time. He said, I stuck these acorns in a bucket of water, and I thought they might, you know, sprout and make some trees, and I forgot about them. Next spring, my mama found the bucket on the back porch, and the acorns had turned to stone. He said, would you like them for your museum? I said, of course. I come on down and see the petrified acorns. More on petrification on video number uh, six. So kids, when they tell you the layers are different ages, you tell them, Kent Hovind said, they're confused or they're lying. It is not correct. 
Those layers all form, nearly all of them, at the time of Noah's flood. 80 to 85 percent of Earth's surface does not even have three geologic periods appearing in correct consecutive order. Even though this geologic column does not exist, except in the textbooks, that teaching is what changed people in the 1830s away from believing the Bible to believing in uniformitarianism. This teaching especially affected a young preacher. He just got out of Bible college, studied to be a pastor of a church. His name was Charles Darwin. Anybody ever heard of Charles Darwin? Charles Darwin graduated from Bible college to be a preacher, and he's going to sail around the world for five years first and collect some bugs for some, you know, bugologist back there in England. Charlie brought some books with him. He brought his Bible, of course. He just got out of Bible college. And he brought this brand new book, Principles of Geology. Charlie said that book changed his life forever. He later wrote to a friend and said, Disbelief crept over me slowly. I felt no distress. He slowly lost his faith in the Bible. As Darwin sailed around the world, he stopped off at the Galapagos Islands. Here on those islands, he noticed there were 14 different varieties of finches. Little tiny bird with a little tiny beak but the beak shapes were different. Now the Grants went there and studied them and said, wow, during dry years, the beak is a tenth of a millimeter thicker, and during wet years, it's a tenth of a millimeter thinner. But it always averages back out. A tenth of a millimeter, do you know how much that is? Not much. Darwin looked at the birds and said, you know what? I think all these birds had a common ancestor. I bet you're right, Charlie. It was a bird. And then Charlie said, well, maybe this proves that birds and bananas are related. You say, oh, he never said that. Uh, he sure did. I knew you wouldn't believe me, so I brought his book. It's right here. Principles, I'm sorry, uh, The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin. On page 170, Darwin said, it's a truly wonderful fact that all animals and all plants throughout all time and space should be related to each other. Isn't he saying the birds and bananas are related? He sure is. This is a lie. What Charlie observed is what is sometimes called microevolution. Microevolution tells us dogs produce a variety of dogs. That's a fact. It happens, okay? And roses produce a variety of roses. Nobody argues about that. The question is, does it go any farther than that? You may get a big dog or a little dog, but you get a dog every time. And probably the dog, the wolf, and the coyote had a common ancestor. I wouldn't argue about that. We did the test this morning. Had a five-year-old girl. Said, okay, here we have a dog, a wolf, a coyote, and a banana. Which one is not like the others? She got it. The banana. We got college professors can't figure that out. Here's National Pornographic uh, Geographic says, uh, the evolution of dogs from wolves. Well, duh, nobody's arguing about that. Yeah, dogs came from wolves, okay? The Bible says they bring forth after their kind. Ten times it says that in the first chapter. See, this word evolution has six meanings. We've been through this before, so I'm going to go through it kind of quickly. There's, first of all, cosmic evolution, Big Bang. Secondly, chemical evolution, where all the chemicals come from hydrogen. That's baloney. Thirdly, stellar evolution, where all the stars form from dust. You cannot get dust to condense into a solid star. Can't happen. There's Boyle's gas laws that drive it away, okay? Then there's enough stars out there, though we can all have 11 trillion to ourselves. Then you have organic evolution, where life gets started from non-living material. And then macroevolution, where an animal changes to a different kind of animal. None of those have ever been observed. Number six, variations within the kinds, sometimes called microevolution. That one happens. The first five are religious. So whenever you discuss evolution, you have to define what you're talking about. If you're talking about number six, I'm with you. I agree that happens. If you're talking about the first five, that doesn't happen. That's something you believe happens, okay? Watch how they change the definition for the kids. They say, okay, boys and girls, evolution is change over time. Uh, is that really what they mean? Watch this carefully now. In other words, living things have changed over time. Wait, wait, wait. Are you going to skip over the first four? They just want to bypass the first four stages like it's not part of the theory? Well, then you don't have a coherent theory. Then they say, evolution is defined as a change in species over time. Now they're down to what I believe in. I think species can change. I think you can get some really weird varieties of animals, but they're still the same kind, okay? This is a lie, kids. That's not really what they mean by evolution. They want to give you examples of number six and make you believe that the whole theory has been proven. Don't get brainwashed. 
Most evolutionists will say, well, macroevolution is just micro with longer periods of time. No, it's not. They had a big conference on this very question in Chicago. They said the central question of the Chicago conference was whether the mechanisms underlying microevolution can be extrapolated to explain the phenomena of macroevolution. The answer can be given as a clear no. It doesn't work. Variations happen, sure, but they have limits. Did you know farmers have been trying to get bigger pigs for a long time? You think they'll ever get a pig as big as Texas? Nah, I bet there's a limit in there, okay? Roaches become resistant to pesticides. Do you think they'll ever become resistant to a sledgehammer? <laughs> Probably not. See? There's a tiger had three kittens, all different colors, same litter. That's variations, but it's still a tiger. That's not evolution. They always end up producing the same kind of offspring, just like the Bible says. The information for the new variety had to be in the gene code already, or it couldn't produce it. No new information is ever added. The gene pool of the new variety is always more limited. Somebody spent years crossbreeding dogs to develop the Chihuahua. All that money to make a dog that's 100% useless. I mean, think about it. How long would the Chihuahuas last in the real world? Turn them all loose into the woods. Watch what happens. They'd run up to the wolf. Yep, 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 yep. Crunch. End of gene code, right? <laughs> Genetic information is lost, not added, when you get a strange variety. Real evolution would need an increase in genetic complexity. We don't ever observe that. Now, I grew up in Illinois, corn country. Did you know there are so many kinds of corn up there, they have to number them? You'll be driving down the highway, and there's a sign that says BX65. Don't mix it with XL29. Something will explode. But folks, you can crossbreed corn from now till the cows come home, and you are always going to get corn. You're never going to get a hamster or a tomato or a whale to grow on your corn stalk. It just ain't going to happen, okay? There's a whole variety of dogs in the world, and they might have had a common ancestor, a dog. There's BBC News. It looks like 95% of current dogs came from just three original founding females. Hey, they're getting closer. Right here it says, Today's dogs come in all shapes and sizes, but scientists believe they evolved from just a handful of wolves tamed by humans living in or near China less than 15,000 years ago. <laughs> they're getting closer. Man, if they keep studying their Bible, keep studying the science, they're going to be an independent Baptist when they're done. <laughs> you get done climbing the mountain of truth, that's where you end up, you know. Okay. The Cyrus textbook calls them divergent evolution. Oh, come on. They show five dogs around a wolf. and That's not divergent evolution. Don't give it a fancy name. It's still a dog. It's just a variety of dog. This Mexican textbook says, the horse and the zebra had a common ancestor. I agree. It looked like a horse. You know, four-wheel drive, genuine leather upholstery, all the standard horse equipment, okay? They got little tiny horses today. We had the world's smallest horse come visit our dinosaur adventure land. Talk about useless. I mean, you know, you can't ride it. Well, my granddaughter could, but uh, it won't bark, you know. What do you do with a horse like that? Uh, you know, horses, zebras, and asses can all be crossbred. They have competition in California. Who can get the weirdest animal? They get zorses, zonkeys, zeonies, zedonks, zebras, and shebras. Here's a zebra who forgot to put his PJs on. <laughs> Here's a herd of zebroids running around. You know, in the last hundred years, the Kentucky Derby has gone from an average winning speed of 127 seconds down to 123 seconds. Now, even in the old days, they had some pretty low times turned in, okay? Question, how much money would you guess has been spent on selective breeding trying to get the fastest horse for the Kentucky Derby? Millions and millions of dollars. They do the same thing right around here, don't they? Spend lots of money for a Tennessee walker. What's the most expensive Tennessee walking horse that you've ever heard of? A million dollars for one horse? Three million for one horse. That's how much per pound? <laughs> Man, I was in Italy. We ate horse over there. It's good, too. It tastes like chicken, you know? Uh. Now, I don't know if they've got to the absolute limit of horse speed or not. I don't know. But I suspect they're getting kind of close, okay? If you really want to win the Kentucky Derby, why don't you breed wings on your horse and fly around the track in 12 seconds? <laughs> the whole point is, sure, you get varieties, but they're limited. There's a bunch of different kinds of cows in the world, and they might have had a common ancestor. 
a cow. This magazine's where you order chickens. All right, boys and girls, should we order, you know, cinnamon queens, red rocks, white rocks, cherry eggers, or brown leghorns? But look what the magazine says. Jungle fowl are the original bird from which all varieties and strains of domesticated chickens are derived. Did you know all the chickens had a common ancestor? Anybody want to guess what it was? Chicken. You got it. There are eight kinds of bears in the world, and they might have had a common ancestor. A bear. Mm -hmm. You know, broccoli, ca cabbage, cauliflower, and Brussels sprouts all have a common ancestor called a plant. Mm -hmm. In California, they've got huge fields where they graft English walnut trees onto black walnut stumps. They do it because the black walnut stump, the root system is tough and can handle the weather over there, but the black walnut doesn't taste as good, it doesn't sell for as much money, and it's tougher to crack. English walnuts taste better, they sell for more money, and they're easier to crack, but the root system rots. So they cut them off and stick them together. They do it all over there. Well, they can do it because they're both a walnut. See, you could never graft an English walnut tree onto the back of a turtle. That won't work, see? The sugar beets were used for years. When sugar got expensive, they wanted to get sugar out of beets. So they tried to do selective breeding to increase the sugar content in sugar beets. They raised it from 6% to 17%, but could not. They, they ran into a brick wall. Hey, can't go past 17. And the further they got away from the normal wild sugar beet, the more problems they started having. Now you've got to babysit the field and spray pesticides and bugicides and everything else on it, okay? Because it's the disease resistance goes down. People say, don't bacteria become resistant to drugs? Well, that's because they lose information, not gain it. I'll show you. Dr. Spetner points out, this is based on a misunderstanding for the mutations that cause antibiotic resistance still involve information loss. For example, to destroy bacterium, the antibiotic streptomycin attaches to part of a bacterial cell called ribosomes. Mutations sometimes cause a structural deformity in ribosomes. Since the antibiotic cannot connect with the misshapen ribosome, the bacterium is resistant. Even though this turns out, mutation turns out to be beneficial for the moment, it still constitutes a loss of information, not a gain. No evolution has taken place. The bacteria are not stronger. In fact, under normal conditions with no antibiotic present, they are weaker than their non-mutated cousins. I'll give you an example. Suppose somebody's coming through town and they're handcuffing everybody, taking them off to jail, and then they're going to kill them. But you don't have any arms, so they can't handcuff you. Aha. Uh -huh. Is that a beneficial mutation to not have arms? Well, yeah, for, a mo for the moment, okay. <laughs> but in, in long term, it's not beneficial, okay. And so the, all the examples they ever point to are bacteria becoming resistant to drugs. That's a loss of information, not a gain. The Bible is correct. They bring forth after their kind. James Hutton wrote a book in 1795, and people began to doubt the earth was 6,000 years old. Charlie, Darwin, or Charlie Lyle wrote a book in 1830, and people began to doubt the flood, and Charlie Darwin's book made people doubt the Creator. And by the mid-1800s, people were wondering, wow, if God didn't do it, how did we get here? Who's in charge of the world? That led directly to the rise of communism, Marxism, socialism, Nazism. We'll cover that on seminar part five. Politically incorrect, the dangers of this evolution theory. Now, Darwin didn't originate the evolution theory. It was around before him. He just simply made it popular, okay? But Timothy was warned by Paul here in 1 Timothy 6, you be careful about avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so-called. Evolution is not science. Evolution's a religion in every sense of the word. Hitler said, let me control the textbooks, I'll control the state. Professor Wilson at Harvard University said, as were many persons from Alabama, I was a born-again Christian. When I was 15, I entered the Southern Baptist Church with great fervor and interest in the fundamentalist religion. I left at 17 when I got to the University of Alabama and heard about evolution theory. He lost his faith, first year of college. That's what happened to Philip Wentworth. Studied for the ministry at Harvard, lost his faith, gave up on the ministry. That's what happened to Scott. He almost lost his faith, so somebody showed him one of my videotapes. And he said, oh, man, you, you saved my faith, Brother Hoven. This, uh, Mary wrote me, or Marty wrote me and said, I want to let you know your ministry has been a blessing to me. I'm one of the high school students in the anthropology class that is a victim of the dangers of evolution teaching. I was very discouraged and questioned the existence of God. I listened to your seminars, and that completely encouraged me, and it was a blessing to me. Yay, rescued one. It's amazing how many thousands of people down through history have lost their faith 
because of this evolution teaching. Karl Marx studied, uh, said he wanted to serve God with his life, went off to college, became an evolutionist. Comrade Stalin, there was a special this afternoon on TV, how many saw that about Comrade Stalin on the History Channel? He went to a Christian school, read Darwin's book, became an atheist, killed between 60 and 100 million of his own people. Andrew Carnegie became an evolutionist reading Darwin's book. He said it freed him from the shackles of religion. Light came in as a flood and all was clear. Not only had I got rid of theology and the supernatural, but I found the truth of evolution. Carnegie left behind millions of dollars to make sure evolution is taught in our schools instead of creation. He funded the National Center for Science Education. The list is really long. We'll have to quit now. But 75% of kids from Christian homes that go to public schools lose their faith after one year of college. What's in these textbooks anyway? What are they teaching our kids that's making them lose their faith? Well, we're going to cover some of the lies in the textbooks, some more lies in the textbooks in the next session. There is no known evidence to support the evolution theory except things that have been proven wrong a long time ago. If real evidence exists for this evolution theory, I would like to see it. We've been offering a quarter of a million dollars for real scientific evidence for evolution. We've had that offer for over 10 years. There isn't any, okay? I'll give you an example. Suppose I had a theory that the moon is made of green cheese. Now, that's a dumb theory, I know. But hey, it's okay to have a dumb theory. There are no laws against dumb theories. But then suppose I started teaching my students, hey kids, did you know NASA proved my theory in 1973 when they went there on a secret mission and drilled a hole and found the moon is made of green cheese? Oh, now hold on a minute. It's okay to have a dumb theory. It's not okay to lie about my evidence for my theory, okay? It is worse for me to get paid by tax dollars while I lie about my theory. So I don't mind if they want to have a theory that we came from a rock. That doesn't bother me. It does bother me that they want to lie to the students about their evidence, and it really bothers me that I have to pay their salary while they lie to support spread their theory. So here's some of the evidence they use for evolution theory. They say, we have evidence from fossils. I say, guys, you've got to be kidding. No fossil counts as evidence for evolution. None. If you find bones in the dirt, all you know is it died. You don't know it had any kids. No fossil could count as evidence for evolution. None. They say, we have evidence from structure, from molecular biology, from development. Well, let's talk about a few of these. Evolution is dead. The theory is defunct. There is no evidence to support it. But some of the followers are pretty dedicated, and they're having a hard time letting it go. They'll even lie to you to make you ever think everything's fine. They say, wow, look at that evolution theory. It's perfectly fine. There's no challenge to evolution. Look, he never looked better. Pulse and heart rate look good. No, I'm sorry. He's a goner, okay? <laughs> Don't be the last one off the boat. It is sinking. Evolution is based on two faulty assumptions. Number one, they say mutations make something new. That's never been observed. Number two, natural selection makes it survive and take over the population. Evolution is actually a religion of death. In order for evolution to work, one animal evolves a little better than the rest. What must happen to the rest of them to make this thing work? They got to die or else the new improved gene is swamped back into the gene code. The question is so simple and profound. Did man bring death into the world like the Bible says? Or did death bring man into the world like evolution says? Somebody is wrong. Textbook says there are mutations and they are the original source of variation in populations. I agree, mutations happen, no question. But mutations do not produce any evolution. Mutations scrambling up are scrambling up existing genetic code. They're not making anything new. Here's a five-legged bull. That's a mutant. There's no new information added. He already had the information on how to make a leg. It just made one in the wrong place, that's all. It's not new information. It is scrambled information. Here's a short-legged sheep. Again, no new information. And by the way, that's not beneficial. He's the first one the wolf is going to catch. Right? Oh, boys, go. Here comes the wolf. Brrr. Oh, Herman didn't make it. Mm. There's a two-headed lamb. That's a mutant. It's not beneficial. Two-headed turtle. That's a mutant. Not ninja, but it's mutant. Okay. Now, he's going to freeze first winter because nobody makes a double-neck turtleneck sweater. He's just not going to make it. Now, scrambling up the letters of the word Christmas will get you all sorts of different words, but it will never get you Xerox, zebra, or queen. The letters aren't available. This textbook shows the kids a four-wing fly, which, by the way, cannot fly. And it says, boys and girls, 
Normal fruit flies have two wings. This mutant has four. This rare mutation, like most mutations, is harmful. And then it says, beneficial mutations are the raw material for natural selection. <laughs> now, hold on a minute. Why don't they show us an example of a beneficial mutation? Why did they tell us about the good ones and not show us a picture of a good one? You know why they didn't show a picture of a good mutation? Because nobody's ever seen one. There's never been one beneficial mutation. I, was, I said that in a debate one time, and this atheist said, Hovind, you're lying. He said, I can name a beneficial mutation right now. He said, people in Africa <clears throat> that get sickle cell anemia are less likely to get malaria. I said, that's brilliant, sir. That's like saying if you cut off your legs, you can't get athlete's foot. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> they're both negative, okay? Then they say evolution and natural selection go together. This one says natural selection causes evolution. That's a lie. Natural selection selects. It doesn't create anything. Natural selection is not a creative force, okay? Natural selection may be a stabilizing force, but it is not a creative force. Anybody with half a brain can figure that out. Natural selection cannot create any properties. It can only select. This textbook says, Evolution by natural selection had occurred in just one year. Oh, they're lying. It says natural selection can lead to evolution. That's a lie. Natural selection selects. It doesn't create a thing. If you worked in a factory that made cars, how far is the Saturn plant from here? Pretty close, isn't it? How many of you work? Anybody here work in the Saturn plant? Okay. And suppose you worked in quality control. Your job was to check the car when they got done building it, you know, kick the tires, slam the doors, and drive it around, see if it runs. If you caught every single mistake, they don't, by the way, <clears throat> but if you did, okay, how long would it take that quality control process to change the car to an airplane? You say, Hovind, quality control can't change it to something else. Oh, I know. Only design engineers can change it. And God's natural selection is a quality control that will never change it to a different animal. It'll just make sure you get a good animal, that's all. They keep talking about survival of the fittest. Well, I agree, but that doesn't explain arrival of the fittest. And even survival of the fittest is pretty shaky. It's what's called a tautology, a sentence that means nothing. I'll show you. If you say, Professor, <clears throat> why did it survive? It's, oh, because it's the fittest. You know, survival of the fittest. How do you know it's the fittest? Uh, because it survived. How else can you tell? Oh, I see. Look, if a whale goes through a school of fish and eats 80% of them, it's not survival of the fittest. It's actually survival of the luckiest. That's what's really going on out there. But some of these scientists have the ability to make amazing observations and still come to the wrong conclusion. One day, a bunch of scientists were going to see how far a frog could jump. They put their big old frog down there and said, jump, frog, jump. That frog jumped 80 inches. They brought the frog back, cut off one leg. Said, jump, frog, jump. He only jumped 70. They brought him back, cut off another leg. Said, jump, frog, jump. He went 60. They brought him back, cut off another leg. Said, jump, frog, jump. He jumped 50 inches. They brought the frog back, cut off his last leg, and said, jump, frog, jump. You know, they expected he might go maybe, you know, 40, based on the data. Actual jump was zero. The frog didn't move. They yelled louder, jump, frog. The frog never moved. The scientists were baffled. They tried the experiment again. Uh, new frog. Got the same results every time. So the brilliant scientists put their data together and said, you know what, folks, the frog jumped less as the legs were removed. Hey, that's a good observation. They got it right on the head. And they said, so we must conclude that a frog with no legs goes deaf. bad conclusion. It's possible to have a good observation and still come to the wrong conclusion, you know. That's what they did with the fruit flies. They put them flies in the laboratory. They nuked them, microwaved them, x-rayed them. They did all kinds of mean things to those flies, and they got some weird-looking baby flies. They got flies with curled wings. They fly around, bzzz, 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 couldn't go anywhere. They got flies with no wings at all. Hmm? What do you call that? A crawl or a walk? Can't fly. They raised all these mutated flies in the laboratory and said, you know what, folks, fruit flies refuse to become anything but fruit flies. Well, duh. So they said, all mutations produce flies that were inferior to the original fly. 
Good observation. They said, so we must conclude that flies have evolved as far as they can go. Oh, bad conclusion, you know. Maybe you could conclude that God made them right to begin with, and all you're doing is messing them up in your laboratory. Mm -hmm. They were doing fine till you guys got a hold of them. Yeah. And they say, evolution's as fit as ever. Yep, fruit flies in the north have wings 4% larger than flies in the south. Well, that proves something to somebody somewhere, I'm sure. <laughs> but it's still a fly, okay? Then they tell the kids, the peppered moth is proof for evolution. They counted the moths on the trees and found it was 95% light-colored and 5% black. Then they burned coal in the factories and the trees turned black. And they counted the moths again. It was only 5% light and 95% black. The problem is the entire story is a lie. They glued dead moths to the tree to take that picture for your kid's textbook. It's right here. Where's this book used at, brother? It's not used anymore. Peppered moth. It's still in the new books, though. Evidence for evolution. Those are dead moths glued on a tree, because after 40 years of watching, they found a grand total of two moths on the trees. Two out of, let's see, what's 95% of two? Wow. I have to do some figuring on that one. Uh, <clears throat> they still keep it in the textbooks, though, as evidence for evolution. What's the Tulsa Zoo doing having a peppered moth display? I mean, this is a zoo, for heaven's sake. Why do they push evolution in a zoo? Get the book Icons of Evolution if you want a whole lot more on the history of this peppered moth idea. But <clears throat> they tell the kids, we're going to learn to think critically. Boys and girls, do you think humans are still evolving? What kind of question is that? That's one of those questions like, uh, have you stopped beating your wife yet? <laughs> wow, let me think. If I say yes, I'm admitting I did. If I say no, I'm still doing it. Did you know it's possible for the question to already have a built-in assumption? Look at that question. Do you think humans are still evolving? What's the built-in assumption? That humans evolved. Now, how's a Christian kid supposed to answer that for homework for Monday? Hmm? I would say, teacher, this question is poorly written. It assumes evolution has happened when it has not. It's like asking the question, you know, why are elephants orange? Boy, no, there's a tough one. Why are they orange anyway? Uh, they're not orange? Mm -hmm. This is not learning to think critically. This is a Soviet-style indoctrination-type brainwashing question. And when the kid gets done taking this class, he's going to think he knows how to think. But he doesn't. He knows how to be told what to believe, and he never understands how it happened to him. That's not thinking critically. Then they tell the kids, we've got evidence for evolution from homologous structures. Wow, what's that mean? Yes, boys and girls. Did you know you have two bones in your wrist and they're called the radius and the ulna? Pretty cool. And did you know the alligator has two bones in his forelimb? And look at this. They're called radius and ulna. See that? That proves we are related. That's what they're going to tell them. Homologous structures provide evidence that these animals evolved from a common ancestor. It's found in just about every textbook. You got it in these other ones up here, I'm sure, don't you, Steve? Homologous structures as evidence for evolution. They descended from a common ancestor, textbook says. Think critically. The bones are the same, boys and girls. See, that proves we're related. Evolve from a forelimb of a common ancestor. This textbook says, <clears throat> comparative anatomy provides further evidence of evolution. The commonality suggests that these and other vertebrate animals are all related. They probably evolved from a common ancestor. This is a lie. They probably have a common designer. Mm -hmm. You know, the different bones in different animals come from different genes on the chromosomes. They're not homologous to begin with, okay? And even if they were, that still wouldn't prove common ancestor. It proves a common designer. The same designer made them all. Did you know the lug nuts from a Pontiac will fit on a Chevy? You can go out in the parking lot and try it. They will. That proves they both evolved from Honda 14 million years ago. <laughs> no. It's true many animals have a similar forelimb structure. That's a good observation. I agree. They say they must have had a common ancestor. Oh, bad conclusion. Then they'll say, this helps prove we all came from a rock. Well, now you really have got a bad conclusion there. Then they tell the kids, we have evidence from development. Now, this one makes me angry. So I'm going to try to stay calm while we talk about this is probably one of the most dangerous lies in the textbooks. We'll just calm down now. Okay, I'm ready. 
This textbook says the similarity between the early stages of development of many different animals helped convince Darwin that all forms of life shared common ancestors. Darwin considered this the strongest class of facts in favor of his theory. This was the best evidence Darwin knew of for his theory. The guy who made up this dumb idea is named Ernst Haeckel. Haeckel called this idea we're about to share with you the biogenetic law, which means as animals develop inside the mother, they go through the stages of evolution. All you got to do is memorize the word farm, F-A-R-M, fish, amphibian, reptile, mammal. That's the way they say it happened. The phrase they had for it back then was ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Wow, what's all that mean? Well, ontogeny is the growth of the baby. It goes through stages, okay? Recapitulates means it reenacts or does over again. Phylogeny is the evolutionary sequence. This Irish textbook says, the presence of fish-like structures in embryos of different species shows these animals have evolved from fish and share the basic pattern of fish development. It's as if the embryo retains a memory of its origins and starts to copy them during its development. That's the ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Now the idea that sick mind Freud relied on was the idea that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, that is the development of the individual recapitulates the evolution of the entire species. This is stupid and dangerous. They tell the kids the embryo, the baby growing in the mother, has gills like a fish. Gills? That's a lie. Those are not gill slits. Those little folds of skin you see on the embryo grow into bones in the ear and glands in the throat. They never have anything to do with breathing. My uncle had five or six chins and he couldn't breathe through any of them but the top one. Okay? <laughs> Those are not gill slits. Ernst Haeckel said the turning point in his thinking was when he read Darwin's book in 1860. See, Darwin's book was printed in English in 1859. The next year, it was printed in German, 1860. Haeckel was a German embryology professor. He read the book and said, wow, what a great theory. If only we had some evidence. Well, nine years later, they still had no evidence. So Haeckel decided to help out. He was going to make some evidence. Haeckel took a drawing of a dog and a human embryo he was an embryology professor, you know, and he lied. He faked the drawings. He changed them and made them look exactly alike to prove they're related. He just is a bald-faced lie, okay? Haeckel made giant posters of his fake drawings and traveled all over Germany and converted the people to believing in evolution, which led to the next obvious question. Hey, if evolution is true, I wonder which uh, race of humans have evolved the farthest. And guess who the Germans thought it was? Ah, uh, yeah. We'll talk more about that later. Now, on top are Haeckel's fake drawings. Underneath are the actual photographs of these animals. He lied. His own university held a trial and convicted him of fraud. He said at the trial, I should feel utterly condemned were it not that hundreds of the best observers and biologists lie under the same charge. This biogenetic law is as dead as a doornail. It's not true. But it can't be taken out of the textbooks for some reason. It's been proven wrong since 1875, and they still keep it in the books. It's still used in this book, Evolutionary Analysis, College Textbook, 1998 edition, used at University of West Florida, the exact same chart of Ernst Haeckel. That's only been proven wrong since 1875. Okay? I know it takes a while to get textbooks up to date, but. Uh, that's long enough. I think 130 years, they ought to be able to get it out by now, don't you think? Okay. More about the gill slits in uh, this book here, Icons of Evolution. Darwin's theory, his book came out 1859. He predicted they would find evidence. 1869, Haeckel faked the drawings. 1875, it was proven wrong. But it's still in textbooks used all over the planet. 2004 textbook, still has it. 2005 textbook, and I pronounced it wrong as Chickasha, not Chickasha, Chickasha, Oklahoma. I got corrected during the break. Uh, still teaching the baby has gill pouches. Notice, for example, gill pouches, okay? Gill slits on the embryo. They're teaching this in textbooks all over the world. It's only been proven wrong since 1875. Get it out of the book. Tear the page out. I mean, it's not, it's a no brainer. Tear out the page. It's not true. There's a junior high textbook telling them it has uh, embryo has gills. Let's, this one says, similarly, humans and fish embryos resemble each other because humans and fish share a common ancestor. Three, these similarities provide evidence that these three animals evolved from a common ancestor, tiny gill slits. 
gill slits on the human embryo, gills of fish, tiny gill pouches used in college textbooks. There's a 2004 textbook saying it has evidence of evolution is seen in uh, development of embryos. You can't get a high score on SAT or ACT tests unless you lie and say the baby has gill pouches. It's found on every single test we could find. If you don't believe in evolution, you won't score high to get into college, or at least give the evolution answer. Why would they keep this in the textbooks 130 years after it is proven wrong? Oh, there's only one answer I can come up with. I'll tell you in a minute. This one shows a five to six week embryo, and it says by seven months, the fetus looks from the outside like a tiny normal baby, but it's not. <laughs> it's not a baby at seven months. Hello? That's a lie. It's a human at conception. 34% of babies born at five and a half months will survive. One lady had surgery on her baby before it was born. Cut the mother open, cut the uterus open, and the baby's holding the doctor's finger at five months along. Let's see. The angel of the Lord said, Behold, thou art with fetus. No, I believe he said you're with child, didn't he? Yeah, it's a child before it's born. Hmm? Yeah. Scott Peterson is accused of murdering his wife and unborn child. Now, Paul is on, you hypocrite. Don't you think it's okay to have an abortion and yet you call it an unborn child? Scott Peterson is found guilty of murdering his wife and son. That's because in California you have to have a double homicide to get the death penalty. So they want it to be a son or a child, but the rest of the time if you want to have an abortion it's okay. Now it's not a child, it's just a fetus. Well, let's get consistent here, folks, okay? Which is it? All right? More about embryology on this one, but why do they keep this in the textbooks? It's very simple. That's the only way to justify abortion. They want you to think it's not human yet. Somebody wants to reduce the population of this planet. And abortion has already done 15 or 20 20% 20 of the entire world's population has been killed by abortion. One billion people. Let's see, Hitler killed six million, Stalin about a hundred million, abortions a thousand million. And that's gonna work. We'll cover more on that on video five. Anna Rosa had her arm chopped off in a botched abortion. She was born anyway. They thought they killed her. Everybody says, oh, that's terrible. What if they would have cut her head off instead? We never would have heard about Anna Rosa. Now, I live in Pensacola. You might have heard of my town. We've had two doctors that were doing abortions shot and killed. Several clinics have been blown up or burned down. I did not shoot any doctors, and I did not blow up any clinics, okay? And I don't think Jesus would do it that way. He, did, he, he grew up under Roman control. He didn't go around blowing up tanks and burning down bridges, okay? But when the first doctor got shot, I was preaching in Fort Lauderdale. The next day I flew home, and right in front of me on the airplane were two ladies, I'm sorry, two women from NOW, the National Organization for Wild Women. <laughs> and they were flying up to Pensacola, going to have a big rally and march around town, you know. As we got off uh, the airplane, and I noticed on their shirt it had in huge block letters, Choice Above All. So, being my mild-mannered self, I said, excuse me, ma'am, what does this mean, Choice Above All? She said, a woman ought to have a right to choose. I said, choose what? She said, choose to have an abortion. It's her body. I said, well, yes, ma'am. If she wants to abort her body, I suppose that's fine. <laughs> but it looks to me like she wants to abort somebody else's body. Mm -hmm. When you consider half of them are male, think about it. It's not her body. Mm -hmm. I said, by the way, ma'am, I'm kind of curious about this. I have three kids. I deliver one of my kids at home. I used to raise hamsters. I taught biology and anatomy. I'm kind of familiar with this process. I said, why does the woman's right to choice stop at birth? Why don't we let the mother choose to kill it after it's born? It'd be a lot safer and simpler. Hey, why don't we extend abortion rights up until the kid's two years old? I know a lot of mothers with a two-year-old that have thought about it a time or two. <laughs> I won't ask you to raise your hand, but I know you're out there. I got it. Let's extend abortion rights up until the kid is 18. I bet they'd behave a lot better. Son, one more time, and I'm going to abort you. <laughs> hey, teacher, where, where's Johnny today? Oh, he didn't do his homework yesterday, so his mommy aborted him. Hey, grades would skyrocket, wouldn't they? By the way, Peter Singer is pushing for abortion after the baby's born. 
He's trying to get legislation passed so you can kill the baby up to 28 days after it's born and still call it an abortion. Have you ever noticed the news media calls them pro-choice and they call guys like me anti-abortion? I'm not. They, they do that anti-abortion because it's a negative sounding term. Pro-choice is such a positive sounding term. How about let's call me pro-life and call them pro-death and we both get a positive sounding term. Hmm? That's why I refuse to take the paper. I just can't stand their liberal slant on everything. We get a call once in a while, hey, you want to take the Pensacola News Journal? I say, no, ma'am, we don't have a parakeet. <laughs> That's what I tell them. See, the media will ignore the wishes of the majority, and they're going to push their liberal agenda. We'll cover more on that on part five. Well, remember when the kids got shot in Colorado? Right away, they jumped on the gun control issue. You know, if kids keep getting shot in our schools, maybe it's time to consider some other issues, like uh, should we have public schools? Or maybe should we teach them evolution? Hmm? That's what did the Columbine shooting. Those kids were real strong believers in evolution. They made a videotape before the shooting. One of the boys said, he doesn't deserve the jaw evolution gave him. Look for his jaw. It won't be on his body. They were strong believers in evolution. They did the shooting on Hitler's birthday on purpose. They shot Isaiah Scholes just because he was black. Eric's t-shirt said, natural selection. And then Rosie O'Donnell said, see, we need more gun control. Rosie, Rosie, Rosie. Blaming guns for Columbine is like blaming spoons for Rosie O'Donnell being fat. It's not the spoon's fault. It's not the gun's fault, okay? Maybe certain criminals ought to be publicly executed. Maybe that's time to think that one through one more time. Maybe all law-abiding citizens should be required to carry guns to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. Suppose every teacher in the public school was required to be armed. Just, just suppose. How far down the hallway would those kids have gotten? Somebody sent me this button, proudly unarmed. Would you wear this? <laughs> what does this say to a criminal? <laughs> Rob me. <laughs> Isn't that exactly what it says? <laughs> of course. The Founding Fathers gave us the Second Amendment so we could keep and bear arms, and it wasn't so we could go duck hunting. The purpose of the Second Amendment was so we could defend ourselves if the government goes bad. Last-ditch defense against an evil government is an armed citizenry. You ever notice a lot of animals that eat grass have horns? Did you know you don't need horns to eat grass? The purpose of the horns is to explain to the lion, stay off my back. I just want to eat the grass, leave me alone. And I think everybody ought to be armed, not so we can hurt anybody, but just so we can explain to people, Leave me alone. Don't take my stuff. Don't break into my house. Don't steal my car. Don't come hurt my family. Okay? Thank you. <laughs> now, I probably waited too long. I didn't start my kids shooting until they were about three. I probably should have started about two, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> Here's the logic they use to justify abortion. They're going to say, well, it's not human. Oh, brother. You're either dumb or you're lying. It's human at conception, okay? They're going to say, well, it's not viable. It can't live on its own. You're not viable st yourself stark naked on the North Pole, you know. <laughs> Can't live on its own. I know kids that are 25 that still come borrow money from Dad. <laughs> hey, Dad, can I borrow some money? <coughs> <laughs> you ought to be able to live on your own by now, son. <laughs> They're going to say the child may be unwanted. There's kids that are already born that are unwanted. My parents moved four times when I was growing up, but I found them every time. <laughs> By the way, there's probably five people in this room that have had an abortion. Now, you listen carefully. God loves you. He can forgive you. It's not the unpardonable sin. God can use you in a powerful way. But don't you go through life justifying it. Don't say it was okay. No, it wasn't okay. It was murder. So confess it, forsake it, get right with God, and go serve God with your life, okay? Amen. Half the Bible is written by murderers, okay? <laughs> You're in good company. They're going to say, well, the child may be unwanted. A lot of people are unwanted. Year after year, the number of people waiting to adopt is about equal to the number of abortions. The babies are not unwanted, okay? They're going to say, well, the child may be a financial burden. Show me a kid that's not. <laughs> Anybody got a kid that's not a financial burden? <laughs> They're going to say it may be from rape or incest. 
Well, then you kill the rapist, not the baby. <laughs> Execute the rapist and adopt out the baby. It's not that complicated. Hey, did you know it's illegal to shoot deer at night with spotlights in just about every state? Is it illegal in Tennessee to shoot deer at night with spotlights? Hmm? You've got to give them a sporting chance, right? Let's give the baby a sporting chance. Pass a law in Tennessee that says if a lady goes to have an abortion, the nurse will have a jar of marbles, and we're going to have a lottery, okay? One marble for baby, one for mother, and one for father. <laughs> and one for doctor. <laughs> and one for governor. Yeah, let's put several in there for the past president. And let's really have a choice. Hmm? If he's not alive, uh, why is he growing? If he's not a human being, what kind of being is he anyway, huh? She says, honk if you're pro-choice. It's easy for her to be pro-choice. She's already been born. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but did you know everybody that ever voted for abortion has already been born? Think that one through. They say, well, abortion's legal. Well, that doesn't make it right. 1936, the German Supreme Court declared Jews in Germany are not persons. That opened the way to allow Hitler to kill the Jews. Six million, at least, Jews were killed. I read lots of books about Hitler. I've been to Germany a couple times. Hitler said, I have the right to exterminate an inferior race that breed like the vermin. Hitler thought the Jews were an inferior species. He said, the Germans are the superior race that deserve to rule the world. Hitler was killing the Jews to make more living space for the Germans. He sought to make the practice of Germany conform to the theory of evolution. Hitler said, if you want these criminals, I'll send them to you on luxury ships. You know, in 1938, the Jews could have been saved, but America refused to take them. Every country but Sweden refused to take the Jews. Hitler's book and his mind was captivated by evolutionary thinking, probably since he was a boy. Evolutionary ideas lie at the basis of all that is worst in Mein Kampf. Hitler thought it was the duty of the strong to trample the weak. In his book, Hitler said, Nature does not desire the mating of weaker with stronger individuals. Even less does she desire the blending of a higher with a lower race. Who's a higher race, Adolf? He kept talking about the mingling of Aryan blood all through his book. He talked about Aryan races, lower peoples. Well, I found Hitler's hit list. Hitler thought the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Norwegians were close to pure Aryan. Did you get all that? The blonde-haired, blue-eyed Norwegian, yeah, sure you betcha, oof, hey there, fella. Mm -hmm. He thought the Germans were mostly Aryan, the Mediterraneans are slightly Aryan, the Slavics are half Aryan, half ape, Orientals are slightly ape, black Africans are mostly ape, and Jews are close to pure ape. Hitler killed the Jews to speed up the evolution process. Let's eliminate the inferiors. Anybody know where the Olympics were held in 1936? Berlin. Anybody know who won the most gold medals? Jesse Owens, the black American athlete. Hitler was so angry, he said, it's not fair to make my men race against this animal. Hitler said, I regard Christianity as the most fatal, seductive lie that ever existed. Well, that's because he thought biological evolution would weed out the religion and be a weapon against religion because the Bible teaches all nations are of one blood. And if you think you are superior to somebody because of the color of your skin, number one, you're wrong. Number two, you're stupid. Okay, number three, you're not right with God. Okay, we cover on the, more on the races, and there's no such thing as races. It's just skin colors on video number seven. I stood in the courtroom in Nuremberg where they held the trial years ago. Those guys on trial said, we did nothing illegal. We were just obeying orders. Yeah, and they were found guilty. Anyway, weren't they? Because, see, there's a higher law than Germany's law. It's called... God's law. Now, the Supreme Court in America in 1973 said the word person does not include the unborn. That's the decision that opened the way now for 45 million babies to be killed in America. A thousand million, that's a billion worldwide. On September 11, 2001, 3,000 Americans were killed by terrorists. We spent billions of dollars trying to hunt them down and kill them, right? You know what else happened September 11, 2001? 4,500 Americans were killed by abortionists. 50% more, and nobody said a word. The next day, it happened again. We've had a September 11th tragedy every day, 
ever since. Have we gone nuts? Margaret Sanger started a group called Planned Parenthood to eliminate the inferior species. She wanted to wipe out the blacks, the Jews, and the Orientals. She thought they were human weeds. We could spend all day on Margaret Sanger, but they thought that, just like Hitler said, the Jews are a parasite in the body of nations, Margaret Sanger said the unborn child is a parasite in the woman's body. No, it's a child, okay? It's a baby. We could spend all day on Margaret Sanger. We don't have to take time for that now, but... Um, this is a Planned Parenthood document from 19, <clears throat> uh, 1952. They said, your question's answered about birth control. What is birth control? Is it an abortion? They said, oh, definitely not. An abortion requires an operation. It kills the life of a baby after it has begun. Well, you bunch of hypocrites at Planned Parenthood, now they're the biggest funder of abortions in the country. These six things doth the Lord hate. Hands that shed innocent blood. God hates this. Cursed be he that taketh reward to slay an innocent person. And all the people shall say, Amen. Amen. Your textbooks are going to tell you kids that you have an appendix that is vestigial. You don't need it anymore. That's a lie. You need your appendix. The appendix is part of your immune system. Here's an article on the web from University of Chicago. Ask a scientist. Nancy writes in and says, what is the function of the appendix in a human before it is taken out through surgery? This lady writes back and says, the appendix has no known function. It, she's way behind the times on that one. She goes on to say, it is believed that the appendix will gradually disappear in human beings as our diet do not includes cellulose no more. <laughs> our diet do not include cellulose no more. <laughs> University of Chicago, wow, good place to get an education. Uh, not in English apparently, but in the first place, this is not true, okay? The appendix is part of your immune system. You need your appendix. The appendix activates killer B cells like your thyroid activates killer T cells. It's true you can live without your appendix. That's true. You can live without both your legs and both your arms and both your eyes and both your ears also. Doesn't prove you don't need them. If you take your appendix out, you've got a much better chance of getting all sorts of diseases. This textbook says the whale has a vestigial pelvis. Many organisms retain traces of their evolutionary history. For example, the whale retains pelvic and leg bones as useless vestiges. National Center for Science Education teaches, Bossy the cow evolved to blowho the whale. The cow evolved to the whale. And the evidence is the pelvis. Whales have a pelvis, vestigial pelvis and leg bone that serve no purpose. They have hind limb bones that have no function. Just imagine whales walking around. It's true. Well, here's the bones they're talking about right there. Just imagine the whale walking around. I have tried and tried to imagine, and I just can't do it. Almost every type of whale has these bones there, right there in the abdomen. They are not attached to the spine. That's correct. Textbook says the whale's pelvis is located far from the vertebra and has no apparent function. The whale's pelvis is evidence of its evolution from four-legged, land-dwelling mammals. This is a lie. Those little bones are anchor points that special muscles attach to that allow the whales to reproduce. Whales are kind of big, you know. And without those special muscles and those special bones, they can't get more baby whales. So either these guys are ignorant about their whale anatomy or they're lying to your kids trying to spread their theory. But it's not true that those are vestigial, okay? There are no vestigial organs, and if there were, think about it, that would be the opposite of evolution. That's losing, not gaining. How's that going to help? You lose everything until you have it all? We could spend two days on whale evolution. Every one of them, Ambulocetus and Pachycetus, have all been proven baloney. They can't be intermediate species, okay? The authors were certain the feet were enormous, even though nothing was found. <laughs> Basilosaurus could not possibly have been ancestral to any of the modern whales. Pachycetus was made from one small piece of jaw, a few, a small piece a small piece of skull, a small piece of jaw, and a few teeth. 
you find a little bit of jaw, a little bit of skull, a couple of teeth, and you know that it's half whale, half something on land? That's kind of a stretch, don't you think? Yeah, we'll cover more on that later, but there's all kinds of stuff on our website about this. Um, I've got in my museum a 15 and a half foot python snake skin. If you look at the south end of that snake skin, it's got a couple claws attached to a little two inch bone going up inside the snake's body. We've got them in our, we've got it in our museum, okay? Textbook says, see boys and girls, this is a vestigial structure. The boa and the python have these little tiny claws. Do whales or snakes have back legs? You can see that they don't. Yet, both animals have vestigial hip bones and leg bones where legs may once have existed. This is a lie. This textbook says they have reduced hind legs, rudimentary hind legs of a python snake. You've got to be kidding. Those little claws are used in mating, okay? The snake doesn't have any arms, and you can't talk and say, uh, scoot over, honey, okay? This has nothing whatsoever to do with walking on land. It has to do with getting baby snakes. So once again, somebody's real dumb about their snake anatomy, or they're lying to your kids trying to spread their theory. This textbook shows the coccyx, the human tailbone, and a Discover magazine, and it says, that's all that's left of the tail that most mammals still use. Humans have a tailbone that is of no apparent use. I was in a debate in Huntsville, Alabama, against the president of the North Alabama Atheist Association. He got up in front of God and everybody and said, folks, I've got proof for evolution. Humans have a tailbone they no longer need. I said, uh, Mr. Patterson, I taught biology and anatomy. I happen to know there are nine little muscles that attach to the tailbone, <clears throat> without which you cannot perform some valuable functions. I won't tell you what they all are, but trust me, you need those muscles. I said, now, if you think the tailbone is vestigial, I, Kent Hovind, will pay to have yours removed. <laughs> Bend over. <clears throat> Critical thinking, this book says, 2005 edition. At the end of your backbone is a coccyx, a few small bones that are fused together. Could the human coccyx be a vestigial structure? Or is it the start of a newly evolving structure? That's thinking critically. They give the kids two answers, two options, both of which are wrong. There's a third option, you know. Maybe it's fine just like it is. Notice they don't give that as an option, do they? Maybe it was designed to support your colon and support your lower back for posture when you sit, and five or six other things you can read your Gray's Anatomy about, okay? They say, aren't babies born with tails once in a while? No. Well, that baby's got a tail right there. No, he doesn't. It's not a tail. That's just fatty tissue. There's no bone, no muscle, no cartilage. It's not even lined up with the spine. It has to do with the way the baby develops inside the mother. There's fat around the nervous system to protect it until the bone grows around it. And extremely, generally, the, the fat is resorbed into the system as the baby grows and develops bone. But on extremely rare occasions, the fat is excluded outside the body like a big wart. So what you do, you cut it off, sew it up, put a diaper on the kid, and send him home. It's just nothing like a, it's just like a wart. That's all it is. Cut it off. It's not a tail. This one says, the coccyx is a small bone at the end of the human vertebral column. It has no present function. And it's thought to be the remainder of bones that once occupied the long tail of a tree-living ancestor. They told me when I was a kid, man used to have a tail, but he lost it because he didn't need it. I thought, didn't need it? Have you ever thought how handy a tail would be? <laughs> have you ever come to the door with two sacks of groceries? <laughs> man, wouldn't that be nice to be able to grab that door and walk right in there? You could drive down the highway and hold that can of Coke and tune the radio knob all at the same time. <laughs> lost it because we didn't need it. That's a lie. Everything used as evidence for evolution has been proven wrong. If real evidence exists, I'd like to see it. We'll pay a quarter million dollars for real proof for evolution. But don't lie to me. I think you ought to demand that your school board cut out pages with lies on them. Don't put up with that stuff. I was in a speaking at University of West Florida, and this one biology teacher said, Hoven, I don't think we should deface textbooks. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, tonight you said we should cut out the pages with this stuff on it. We shouldn't deface a textbook. I said, well, sir, uh, suppose you were teaching math and you found a book that said 2 plus 2 is 5. What would you tell your students to do? 
He said, I would tell them to mark out the wrong answer and write in the right answer. You would deface a textbook? I said, now, sir, you teach biology, don't you? He said, yes, I do. I said, well, suppose you found one of your textbooks that taught the embryo has gill slits or the snake has a vestigial pelvis or, you know, all this stuff I covered tonight. Are you going to tell your kids to tear that page out? He said, oh, no, no. I said, would you tell them to mark it out and then write something in the column that it's not correct? He said, no, no, no. I said, would you at least put a warning sticker in the front cover that said, hey, kids, the information on page 85 is wrong. Would you at least warn them? He said, oh, no, no. I said, you would correct a math book, but you won't correct a biology book. I said, you, sir, are a hypocrite. And the folks in this county need to help you get a different job pick, and peaches are changing tires. But you've got no business taking our tax dollars to lie to these kids coming through your class. We're paying for this school. Why don't you be respectful and resign or quit lying to the kids? He said, Hovind, you don't have much tact. Oh, I made full contact with that guy, that's for sure. Okay. <laughs> Evolution is... Unproved and unprovable. We believe it because the only alternative is special creation. They just don't want to believe this. They don't want to believe in creation. And they're willing to believe a lie rather than believe the truth, just so they can support their wicked lifestyle. Psalm 94 says, He that formed the eye, shall he not see? God formed the eye. Eyeballs are incredibly complicated. Charles Darwin said, to suppose that the eye could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd. But then he goes on for three or four pages and says how he thinks it happened anyway. Your eyeball is amazing. You know, at the back of your eye, there are 137 million light-sensitive cells in one square inch called your retina, all of them wired straight to the brain. How would you like to hook up 137 million electrical connections in one square inch? My Heavenly Father did. He's pretty smart, isn't he? Now, I debated one atheist one time, and he said, Hoven, the eye is an example for evolution because it's poorly designed. I said, what on earth are you talking about? He said, well, the light comes into your eye, and then it goes through blood vessels in front of the retina. He said, that's wired backwards. He said, the octopus has a much better eye because their blood vessels are behind the retina. I said, sir... Let me just explain something to you, okay? I said, we live in the air. <clears throat> now, air is a pretty poor insulator for UV light. So your body has, is designed with the blood vessels in front of the retina. That's your body's last defense against ultraviolet light. Now, octopus live in the water, okay? Water blocks UV light. So they don't need their blood vessels in front. See, we're designed for living in air, and they're designed for living in water. Now, if you want to swap eyes with an octopus, you just go ahead, sir, but you're going to be blind in a few days, okay? Because they don't have the blood vessels in front to block the UV light. What a dumb evidence for evolution. What they're trying to say is, well, God wouldn't do it this way, so it must have evolved. Well, that's a silly argument for evolution. Maybe you just don't understand why it was designed that way. I think man's understanding of the human body... It's about like putting a five-year-old kid under the hood of your car and saying, hey, kid, take out whatever this thing doesn't need. <laughs> you don't know what any of it does. You can take it all out, right? You know, your eyeball's amazing. It would take a minimum of 100 years of cray computer time to simulate what takes place in your eye many times every second. Eyeballs are amazing. But this textbook says, the complex structure of the human eye may be the product of millions of years of evolution. Why doesn't God get the glory for what he did? This textbook shows the kids a bird eye and a reptile eye, and it says right up here, boys and girls, you can better understand how the eye might have evolved if you picture a series of changes. You have to imagine how it happened. Just imagine the eye changing. That's not science, <laughs> imagining how it happened. Where's the evidence? See, evolution only takes place in the imagination never takes place in reality. They're lying to you, okay? He that formed the eye, shall he not see? Science deals with things we can observe and study and test. You don't observe anything about evolution. If you have something that's designed like an eyeball, it demands a designer. If painting is proof there was a painter, even if you never see the guy. A building is proof there was a builder, and a watch is proof there was a watchmaker, and design, the creation, is proof there was a creator.
See, design simply demands a designer, period. Invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. They are without excuse, the Bible says. There's no excuse. The psalmist said, when I consider the heavens. You know, God knows that the study of science will draw us to him. Satan knows that too. So Satan has worked really hard in the field of science to make sure it pushes kids away from God. And we need some good godly science teachers to get involved in the school system and turn this thing around. Okay? And by the way, we can prove the existence of God by the impossibility of the contrary. It's impossible that there not be a designer. It's just not possible. There had to be a designer. Okay? I like to show evolutionists this picture. I say, guys, here we have, as far as I know, the world's largest rock group. Ah, uh, you know of a bigger one? I'd like to see it, okay? Um, I'll say, do you think there's any way George Washington's face could have appeared on this rock by chance? I say, no, it was designed by a guy named Borglum. Took him a long time to build it. Okay, very good. Now, let me ask you a question. You say there's no way this uh, face could appear on the rock by chance. You don't think wind could have done that? Abrasion, exfoliation, thermal expansion of the rock? Nothing? Nope, nope, happened by, happened by design. Okay, now let me ask you this question. Do you think George Washington himself with 50 trillion cells in his body, and all these complex systems happen by chance? I say, yeah. Now, wait, wait, wait. You don't think his face could appear on a rock by chance, but you do think his whole complex anatomy could happen by chance. Are you dumb in any other area, or is that the only one, you know? <laughs> then they tell kids that plants are adapted to their environment. Adapted? Yes, boys and girls, gills are an adaptation to living in water. Oh, well, how did they live before they adapted the gills? Hmm? Well, you see, Mr. Hoven, for millions of years, they all died. None of them lived until they adapted the gills. Oh, I see. Why don't they say it's a design feature? See, they avoid using the word designed because then some kid's going to say, who's the designer? Hmm? Adaptations for living on land. Legs. Oh, yes, boys and girls, legs support the body's weight as well as allow movement from place to place. Well, that's true. It doesn't prove they adapted by themselves, though. Lungs. Oh, boy, the delicate structure of a fish's gills depends on water for support. On land, lungs carry out gas exchange. That's true. That's not proof one change to the other, though. They just make this mental, imaginary connection in the kids' minds. I've got a Casio data bank stopwatch, or uh, watch, okay? Holds 300 phone numbers. It's a calculator, stopwatch, an alarm clock, and a countdown timer. It does not tell time. I have to look at it. But it's a pretty amazing machine. 70 bucks at Walmart. Um, I was in Japan a couple years ago, but I did not see the guy who makes the Casio data bank watch. I never saw him. Do I have to see the guy who made it to believe he exists? Hmm. Is it logical for me to stand here in Tennessee and say, I believe there's a watch designer in Japan that made this thing? Is that logical? Even if I never see him? Sure. Would it be illogical for me to say, I've never seen him, so I don't believe he exists? That would be totally dumb, wouldn't it? And you don't have to see the creator to believe he exists, okay? Evolutionists argue against design using arguments they designed. Hmm, think about that one. There's a great book talking about the complexity of living things at a micro scale. We sell the book at our website. Michael Behe wrote this on Darwin's black box. He spends a whole chapter describing the hair on a bacteria. That hair is so complicated, it's attached to a little tiny motor. The motor is so tiny that eight million of them would fit in the cross section of a human hair, but the motor turns 100,000 RPM. Let's see you build a motor like that. Pretty amazing. And as things get smaller, the world they live in feels more sticky to them. The viscosity of the fluid seems greater. So a bacteria swimming through water is about like a person swimming through peanut butter. And that little motor is so powerful and turns so fast, that bacteria can swim about like a person going 60 miles an hour through peanut butter. We've got a little model of it in our museum if you want to come down and see how they work. And the textbook says, Humans probably evolved from bacteria more than 4 billion years ago. What? They can swim through peanut butter 60 miles an hour. We should sign them up for the Olympics, man. We evolved from them? <laughs> We're getting worse, not better. It's a lie. 
Nothing this small and complex could have happened by chance. This is a great book that we sell in our bookstore. Just simple illustrations. Could a box evolve? Could an ink pen evolve? Could a paper clip evolve? It just goes through a bunch of simple things and shows it just can't happen, okay? Then they talk about the origin of life. Yes, boys and girls, how living things started from non-living matter. This is pure baloney, how they teach this in the books. We're going to cover that after a quick break. Cover a few more lies in the textbooks and then tell you what you can do about it. Some practical steps to fix the problem right after the break. In the last two sessions, we covered 15 lies found in the typical textbook. I taught high school science for 15 years, and I'm not against science, I'm not against schools, I'm not against teachers, but I'm against lies. Just don't lie to the kids, okay? The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, Cease, my son, to hear the instruction that causeth thee to err from the words of knowledge. Don't listen to things that are simply not true, okay? Get the lies out of the books. The Bible says God created all things, and it says, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Um, hath not my hand made all these things? God made everything. And the Bible says God formed the entire world. The Bible says God created great whales and every living thing. Now the textbooks in school are going to teach your kids that every living thing happened by itself. They're not going to teach them God created every living thing, that's for sure. Here's a, a textbook that says, The history of life on earth began about three and a half billion years ago. How this occurred has been and will continue to be a topic for inquiry. Let me give you the Hovind translation of what they just said. What they just said is, it's okay to inquire how it evolved. It is not okay to inquire if it evolved. Hey kids, you're allowed to research, you know, how did evolution happen? And if some kid says, well, maybe it didn't happen at all. Oh, shut up, kid. You're out of my class, okay? The only way you can research is, how did it happen? You cannot even ask the question, did it happen? That's not education. That's indoctrination. Okay? I'm sick and tired of paying for that stuff. Now, nobody knows how a mixture of lifeless chemicals spontaneously organized themselves into the first living cell. Paul Davies said, Nobody has a clue how life got started from non-living material by itself. There is not even a good theory how it can happen, but the textbooks are going to teach your kids it just happened, okay? They just tell them, hey, it happened. And you, don't, you can't even consider the option that maybe God made it. Here's what happened. Back in the 50s, two guys, Miller and Urey, decided to figure out how life evolved. So they took a mixture of chemicals and ran it through these tubes and tried to create life in the laboratory. The experiment's been duplicated many, many times, always been a failure and always created more problems for the evolutionist. This textbook says, uh, although he never proved how life originated, he did add evidence to the theory that life could have started by itself. That is a lie. All they did was create problems for the idea that life could have started by itself. This one says, swirling in the waters of the oceans is a bubbling broth of complex chemicals. Progress from a complex chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. <laughs> Boy, it sure is. It don't even happen. That's how slow it is. There are several different articles that say life came from clay. Yep, got some clay together and poof, came alive on the bottom of the ocean. They did not address the origin of uh, life in Darwin's book, and it's never been figured out since how life could have started. What he did is he took these four chemicals and put them in these uh, glass tubes, made them circulate around, and tried to create life in the laboratory. This textbook says, many important events occurred during the Archean era, the most important of which was the evolution of life. Progress from complex molecules to the simplest living organism was a very long process. <laughs> I guess so. If you give it billions of years, somehow it looks more reasonable, you know. This one says, the first living cells emerged between 4 billion and 3.8 billion years ago. There is no record of the event. But you better believe it and you're going to be tested on it. The first self-replicating systems must have emerged in this organic soup. So great, 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 great grandpa was soup. This is one of the lies in the textbooks you kids have to face. Nobody has a clue how life could have gotten started by non-living chemicals. Even Haeckel confessed, he's the guy we talked about in the last session, uh, that made up the idea that the embryo has gill slits, you know, so they could justify abortion. Haeckel said, he claimed that spontaneous generation must be true, not because it had been proven in the laboratory, but because otherwise it would be necessary to believe in a creator. Well, Ernst, I'm sorry, bud, that's just the way it goes. Okay, there's a creator, whether you like it or not, okay? So have they really produced life in the laboratory? Oh, they haven't even come close. Here's what they did. They took four gases. They took methane, ammonia, water vapor, and hydrogen, ran them through these tubes, ran it through a spark chamber to supposed to simulate lightning. <clears throat> they say, we're going to see, we're going to put them together and make life in the laboratory. 
At the bottom of the flask, they got this red goo, and they kept draining the goo off, because if it went through the spark again, it would destroy it. So they had to make the goo and then save it from the next spark, okay? They said in the textbook here it was rich in amino acids, this red goo was. Well, that's simply a lie, okay? They didn't come close to making life. The problem is they had a reducing atmosphere. In other words, he excluded oxygen. You can look at his four gases. There's no oxygen there. He knew if he had oxygen in there, it would oxidize whatever chemicals tried to combine. You know, you cut a banana open and lay it on the table, it turns brown, it oxidizes. You don't paint your car, and it oxidizes, it rusts. Well, living, living cells will, try will oxidize quickly in the presence of oxygen. So he didn't put any oxygen in there. That creates a serious problem, because if you, if you have oxygen, you cannot get life to come from non-living chemicals. The problem is ozone is made from oxygen, and ozone blocks UV light, and UV light destroys ammonia, and ammonia is one of the four gases he's got. So you cannot get life to evolve with oxygen, and you cannot get life to evolve without oxygen. Because if you don't have oxygen, you don't have ozone, and now your ammonia gets destroyed. It's just not going to work either way. And the Earth has always had oxygen, even more than today. This guy said, what evidence is there for a primitive methane ammonia atmosphere on Earth? The answer is there is no evidence for it, but much against it. We find, in general, no evidence in the sedimentary distribution of carbon, sulfur, uranium, etc., of an oxygen-free atmosphere ever existed on the Earth. If somebody tells you the early Earth had a reducing atmosphere, you tell them Kent Hovind said they're confused or they're deliberately lying, because it's not true. The Earth has always had oxygen. This article said, it's suggested from the earliest dated rocks at 3.7 billion years ago, Earth had an oxygenic atmosphere. They've always known the Earth had oxygen, even more than we have today. We covered that on seminar part two, how the early Earth probably had even more oxygen, made them live longer. This textbook says, there was no oxygen on the Earth, which is a lie, and then it says, the rocks absorbed it. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> how can they absorb it if it wasn't there? Well, think about it. Second problem they had with the Miller experiment, they filtered out the product. That is not realistic for nature, okay? They saved the goo from getting sparked the second time because it would have destroyed it. What he actually made in this experiment was 85% tar, 13% carboxylic acid. Now, both of those are poisonous to life. If you make a mixture that's 98% poisonous to the other 2%, I don't think it's logical to say you've succeeded in creating anything that's going to help make life, okay? The problems are he made mostly only two amino acids. There are 20 different ones required to make life. 20 different amino acids. Now, these amino acids are kind of like letters of the alphabet, okay? You have to have 26 letters in the English alphabet to make all the words that we have. Well, you have to have 20 different amino acids to make all the proteins that your body has. With those 20 different amino acids, your body can build a bazillion different kinds of proteins, kind of like you can make a lot of different words with the same 26 letters, okay? What he actually made was a couple of letters, like two of the letters of the alphabet by combining these gases. This creates a real problem since half of them were left-handed and half of them were right-handed. What he actually made was amino acids, only two of them, and half of them were backwards. I mean, if I drop letters of the alphabet, there's a 50-50 chance some of them are going to land upside down. They don't do any good. You have to have them all face in the right way. The smallest proteins we know of have about 70 to 100 amino acids, all of them facing the right way. This greatly compounds the problem, okay? DNA and RNA are all right-handed. All other proteins are left-handed. It's a very puzzling fact. All proteins that have been investigated from animals, plants, and higher organisms, and from simple organisms, bacteria, molds, even viruses, are made of left-handed amino acids. They're all that way. So he's really got a problem since half of his letters were backwards. And there are hundreds of amino acids required to combine in just the right way to make a protein. And they unbond in water faster than they bond. And they claim this all happened in the oceans. Well, the oceans are completely full of water, all the way to the bottom. And Brownian motion is going to drive them apart. It's not going to put them together. One of the lies in the textbooks is that they made life in the laboratory. They have all they've done, every experiment has made the problem worse for the evolutionist, okay? They, spontaneous generations do not occur spontaneously in water. Life is not going to get started in this way. There's a whole lot more in the book, Icons of Evolution, if you want a lot more on the subject to go down deep. But they got this weird idea in their head that all they have to do is get all the right chemicals together and then add energy, and it'll make life. Okay, well, let's do an experiment. Let's put a frog in a blender and turn it on. In a matter of moments, you will have frog nog. And you will have all of the chemicals required to make a frog in one blender, right? Then we're going to add energy. 
You can turn it on puree for 30 minutes. You can nuke it, microwave it, zap it with jumper cables. I don't care what you do. Drop a hand grenade in there. Add all the energy you want, okay? How long will it take to reassemble the frog? It'll never happen. See, just getting the chemicals together isn't the problem. You go to the mortuary. You got a dead body laying there. You got all the chemicals required for life right there in one spot. Bring it back to life. Life is something different. I don't think science has ever defined that clearly, but they talk about how we all came from this early life form. Once this first life form got started, this single cell, then it evolved into everything else. Like this textbook shows the kids that a bacteria slowly evolved to a human. These trees of life are absolute propaganda. There is no evidence for any of these, okay? Even Mary Leakey said, those trees of life with the branches of our ancestors, that's a lot of nonsense, okay? Hey, Stephen Gould said, the evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks are not the evidence of fossils, that's for sure. There is no evidence that any animal is related to any other kind of animal. But this textbook says, all the many forms of life on Earth today are descended from a common ancestor found in a population of primitive unicellular organisms. There's no such thing as a primitive unicellular organism. If it's alive, it's complicated. We'll cover more on that in a minute. And then it says, no traces of those events remain. What they do is they tell the kids, okay kids, the mammals, the birds, and the crocodiles have a common ancestor. They draw these trees in the books, and they look so pretty, and the kid goes, wow, they've got proof. I saw it in my book. <laughs> no, they've got a picture in your book, okay? Everything inside that circle is pure religious speculation. They think it happened, they hope it happened, but there is zero evidence for anything inside that circle. It's one of the lies you're going to have to face in your textbook. The Bible says if you offend one of these little ones, you'd be better off with a millstone about your neck. Go swimming. These folks teaching evolution are in serious trouble when they stand before God. Then they tell them we come from a simple, primitive, unicellular organism. Look, just because it's smaller doesn't mean it's simpler. A paramecium is more complicated than a space shuttle, and you can put thousands of those into one drop of water. Smaller is not simpler. That's one of the lies in the textbooks. I'll show you. Here's a microchip inside a paperclip. Pretty small. Not simple. This microchip is being held in the mouth of an ant, and that little microchip can process every letter of the Bible 200 times per second. Smaller is not simpler. I'll show you. Let's compare the brain of a honeybee to NASA's Cray computer. At one time, the world's fastest computer. I think they got a faster one now. The brain of a honeybee is pretty small. The Cray computer is huge. We would all agree there's a size difference, right? Okay. Now, the Cray computer could do six billion calculations per second. It was estimated that the honeybee's brain is doing about a trillion calculations per second, a thousand billion. So that little honeybee brain is about 133 times faster than a Cray computer. The Cray uses many megawatts. It's power hungry. The honeybee uses 10 microwatts. Did you know honeybees not only make honey, they fly on honey. That's their energy source. And a honeybee can fly a million miles on one gallon of honey. How would you like a machine that gets a million miles per gallon? Especially at today's price of gas, right? Fill up once and you're done for the rest of your life. The Cray costs $48 million. The honeybee's brain is pretty cheap. <clears throat> you splat them on your windshield all the time, right? Many people scramble when the Cray breaks down. Nobody heals the honeybee. A self-healing computer. Steve, you work on computers. How'd you like one of them? Something crashes, reconfigures itself, fixes it all up, no problem. Cray weighed 2,300 pounds. Honeybee's brain doesn't weigh too much. So what should we conclude? Let's see, the supercomputer is huge, it is slow, it is very inefficient, it is power hungry, and it had to be designed. We all know that, right? But did they turn around and look at the honeybee and say, well, that happened by chance? <laughs> and the brain of a human is a whole lot more complex than a honeybee, for heaven's sake. Your brain can hold more information than the entire British library. The human brain is phenomenal, okay? You have more computational power in bits per second than the entire national telephone system. One brain surgeon estimated that there are more connections in your, in just one person's brain, there are more connections than the entire electrical system of the United States. How many wires have been connected together in the United States, would you guess, inside every computer and inside every machine and inside every building? Like zillions of them. One brain has more than that. One professor told me 
that he believed in evolution. And I said, well, sir, do you believe your brain is nothing but three pounds of chemicals that got together by chance? He said, yeah. I said, then how can you trust your thoughts and the conclusions you come to? Maybe you got a chemical in there backwards. He did, by the way, several actually. But then they tell the kids, well, DNA is pretty tiny, but that proves evolution. That's what this textbook says. We have evidence of evolution from molecular biology. Darwin speculated all forms of life are related. This speculation has been verified. They are lying to your kids. Nothing about DNA has helped with the evolution theory at all. DNA, which stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, is the most complex molecule in the universe. Unbelievably complicated molecule. That little DNA molecule, average person has 50 trillion cells in their body with 46 of those little molecules in each cell. 46 chromosome strands in each cell of your body. If you extracted all of it, it would only fill about two tablespoons. But if you took those DNA strands and unwound them, <coughs> stretched them out, tied them together, one person's DNA would reach from Earth to the moon and back over half a million times. Round trips to the moon. They say the DNA holds more, compute, more information than all computer programs ever written by man combined. IBM models the newest computers after DNA. The quantity of information is so vast, we have to invent new numbers to measure it. Not terabytes, petabytes, or exabytes, yottabytes, and zettabytes. All the words uttered by everyone who ever lived would amount to five exabytes. And your DNA and your chromosome holds more information than that. It is so unbelievably complex. If you typed out the code found in your DNA, when you got done typing, you'd have enough books to fill Grand Canyon 78 times. That's the instructions to make you. I'd say you're pretty special. Quite a list of instructions to make you. David said, I will praise thee, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And he didn't have a, he didn't have a microscope, and he could figure that out. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, from conception to birth, the baby adds 15,000 cells per minute to its body. Each one is more complicated than a space shuttle. How would you like to, like to be in charge of the supply end, of supplying a factory that is producing 15,000 space shuttles a minute? And it's your job to make sure they have all the nuts and bolts and screws and everything they need to put that thing together. Some of you women are saying, boy, I did it. And that's hard, too. Sometimes they want pickles in the middle of the night, you know. <laughs> what are you building down there anyway, you know? Uh, <clears throat> the probability of one DNA happening by chance has been calculated to be 1 in 10 to the 119,000th power. That's a big number when you figure the entire visible universe is about 10 to the 28th inches in diameter. DNA has not proven anything that would help the evolution theory. It's been made the problem much, much, much worse. But let's just assume that the chromosome number means something and that, you know, it, it could evolve. Okay, well, then I did some research on this. I discovered penicillin has two chromosomes. That one had to evolve first. And then slowly, over millions of years, they got some more chromosomes, because they're complicated, you know, and turned into a fruit fly. You can see the similarity there. It's only got eight chromosomes. And then very slowly, it evolved some more chromosomes and became either a tomato or a house fly. Very tough to tell the difference. They're identical twins, you know. And then very slowly, over millions of years, it evolved into either a P or a B. You can see the similarity there, you know, P, B, very similar. And slowly became lettuce and then a carrot. And finally, when we got to 22 chromosomes, triplets. The possum, the redwood tree, and the kidney bean all have 22 chromosomes. Average scientists cannot tell them apart. <laughs> let's see, which one is which here? Okay, let's see, tree, possum, bean, huh. Uh, and we have 46, folks. And if we can just get two more, the next step of human evolution, we're going to become a tobacco plant. <laughs> I know some already smell like it. Sometimes I'll get on the elevator and I'll say, man, you're evolving, you're way ahead of me. And it probably won't happen in my lifetime, but we might get enough chromosomes someday to be either a dog or a chicken. They're twins, too, you know. And then way down the road, you know, we're going to become a carp. They got double the chromosomes we do. And someday, star date 34, 95, 72, we're going to become a fern. I was at a church one time, and this lady walked up to me afterwards, and she said, Mr. Hoven, I'm fern. <laughs> I shook hands with that hand right there. I'll never wash it again. Hey. <laughs> How come the evolutionists are always comparing things that fit their theory? Why don't they show us the things that don't fit their theory? 
Like, let's just say we're going to examine how things evolve based upon how long they lived. Well, we could arrange animals by how long they live, and we'll find out the hamster evolved first, slowly turned into a cat, and then a canary, and then a dog, and then a chimpanzee, and an alligator, elephant, horse, turtle, and human. We made it, folks. We made it. Let's, uh, let's ex arrange the animals based on how long they're pregnant, their gestation period. Well, in that case, the possum, only 13 days. How'd you like that, ladies? Only be pregnant for 13 days. Not bad, huh? Yeah, I'd have a bunch of kids in. Uh, slowly evolved into a hamster, then a rat, then a rabbit, kangaroo, on down the list, and the elephant. 640 days. They are the winner. The most evolved creature on earth. Or maybe you can see here the cat and the dog are identical twins, you know. Maybe we should uh, arrange them based on how much they weigh in their adult form. Well, the shrew only weighs four grams. Slowly it became a mouse. And very slowly, slowly, over billions of years, became a whale. The whale's the most evolved now. Why don't they show us these charts, huh? And why is it that amphibians have five times more DNA than mammals, and some amoeba have a thousand times more DNA? They don't tell us these things, because it doesn't fit their theory. It's impossible to arrange in any sort of evolutionary series based on just one little bit of facts. You better find all the facts. You find out this evolution theory fails miserably. But they tell the kids, we're going to think critically, boys and girls. There are 20 kinds of amino acids. That's a fact. Explain how this fact supports the idea that all life shares a common ancestor. How's a Christian kid supposed to answer that for homework for Monday? Hmm? Don't you see a built-in assumption in this question? That's not learning to think critically. Would the kid be allowed, teacher, to explain how this fact that they all have 20, all life forms have 20 amino acids, would the kid be allowed to say, maybe that proves the intelligence of a common designer? Maybe God gave all the animals the same basic 20 amino acids so that uh, we, could, we don't have to just eat each other, you know? I mean, if they're all totally different, wildly different kinds, then we could, we could only eat other humans. But see, God made it this way so the brown cow can eat the green grass and give the white milk and make the yellow butter, and I eat it and get the blonde hair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe that's why there's all the same basic building blocks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the lies they face in the textbooks is this idea that all these similarities prove a common ancestor. Well, let's pretend that it does, okay? This textbook says, humans and orangutans are 96% similar, proving a common ancestor 15 million years ago. I don't think so. Humans and chimps have thousands of differences, thousands of differences. Overall, this guy says, the genetic difference is only 1.6%. Oh, that's what they used to think, but that's a lie. Barney Maddox was the leading genome researcher on this project. He said the genetic difference between human and chimpanzee is at least 1.6%. That doesn't sound like much, but calculated out, that's a gap of 48 million nucleotides. And a change of only three nucleotides is fatal to an animal. He said it's not going to happen. That's when they thought the difference was 1.6%. It's still too big of a gap. Now then, later they found out, oh, actually, it's a 95% similarity, which is 5% difference. And just recently, they said, oh, no, wow, look at this. It's 7.7% difference. The difference, the more we study about this, the worse the problem gets for the evolutionist. Actually, it's becoming worse by the day. This result is based on only 1 million DNA bases out of 3 billion. They've only analyzed one three thousandth of the human DNA code. A very small percent has actually been analyzed. French and American scientists have mapped chromosome 14, the longest sequence to date, and the site of more than 60 disease genes. The feat enlisted nearly 100 researchers and marks the fourth of the 24 human chromosomes mapped so far. If somebody tells you they have mapped the entire human genome, you tell them Kent Hovind said they're mistaken or they're lying. Okay, they've only mapped a small percentage, okay? Then it says, uh, the French National uh, Sequencing Center said the chromosome is, compared, is comprised of more than 87 million pairs of DNA, all of which have been sequenced, so the chromosome's map includes no gaps. This is the longest piece of contigu contiguous DNA sequenced. 87 million pairs, a fraction of the total 3 billion pairs found in the human genome. They still don't know how much there's in there, and it's already 7.7% difference. This researcher said, human genome is littered with up to 20,000 pseudogenes. That proves evolution. I get this in debates all the time. They'll say, what about the pseudogenes? I said, there's no such thing. 
They say, well, yeah, there is. There are thousands of pseudo, which means a false gene. It doesn't do anything. Oh, no. Those pseudo genes serve several purposes. Number one, they serve as decoys to draw you know, poisons away from the real ones. Number two, they serve as backup mechanism. It's like your computer has an automatic backup. You know, if a piece of the memory gets destroyed, another one of those pseudo genes jumps right in, takes over. No, there's not. They took out some of the pseudo genes to see what would happen. They said, well, the mouse doesn't need these things. Let's take them out. And there's how they turned out. They were deformed terribly. No such thing as a pseudo gene. The pseudo gene may function as a decoy to lure away destructive enzymes. Discover magazine of 03. We could spend all day on DNA sequencing, but you know, it could be. We have similar DNA to other animals because we have the same designer. You know, similar bridges would have similar blueprints, wouldn't they? Similar cars would have similar instructions on how to build them, how to make them. Man has a pretty good understanding of how cars work. My daddy started us off boys, started us boys off working on cars when we were, you know, seven years old. I've had 128 cars, I believe. I've rebuilt the motors, the transmissions, the wobble letter shafts, the differentials, the high-speed Knutin valves, and the muffler bearings. I have a pretty good understanding of how cars work. But understanding the operation of a car does not explain the origin of the car. Big difference. See? Let's suppose your son turns 16. All of my kids did a few years ago. Your son comes up and says, hey, Dad, <clears throat> I got my license. Let me see that thing, son. Let me see your license. Come on. Wow, son. That's a lousy picture. It is a good likeness, though. He says, hey, Dad, uh, can I drive the car? Well, son, your mom and I knew this day was coming. The car is a very complicated machine. Did you know there are 3,000 bolts required to hold a car together, and one nut can scatter it all over the highway? <laughs> we don't think you're ready for the whole car, son. We're going to let you slowly evolve into the car. This year, we're going to give you 10%. Next year, maybe just a little more. Hey, what good is 10% of a car? That's what you put in a junkyard. How many things have to be right on a car to make it work? Like thousands of things? Hmm? How many things would have to be wrong to make it stop working? Any one of the many thousands of things. Like not having the keys, you know, not having any gas in it, you know. Take the distributor, distributor cap off and run a pencil around the inside and put it back on. Boy, they'll never find that one. Take the spark plug wire off, run a, put a doorbell wire in there, shove it back down, feed the doorbell wire through the firewall, and weave it through the fabric of the front seat. <laughs> Do that when they're going on their honeymoon, you know, get in the car, wow, let's go, honey. Bam, ooh, ooh, what was that? Okay. There's a thousand things to make your car quit running. <laughs> Probably 10,000 ways to stop a car from running. Shove a potato in the exhaust pipe, you know, <laughs> watch what happens. Uh, I don't want to give you any more ideas, okay? But, uh, <laughs> There are thousands of differences between, him, uh, between <laughs> humans and chimpanzees. But if you think a percentage of similarity proves a relationship, let me show you the research I've been doing. I discovered clouds are 100% water. Watermelons are 97%. It's only 3% difference. That proves they're related. Jellyfish are 98%. Missing link. And so are snow cones. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, there we go. We got the proof, okay? Then they tell them fossils prove evolution. I say, guys, you've got to be kidding. This textbook says, evidence of evolution from the fossil record. Oh, no, don't give me that. That's a lie. There is no fossil record. There's a bunch of bones in the dirt. It's not a record, okay? You're putting your interpretation on those bones they're digging out of the dirt. There is no fossil record. This textbook says, evolution is a fact. The fossil record provides some of the strongest evidence that species evolved over time. This is silly. There is no fossil record. You don't look back into time. You look at a bunch of bones you dug out of the dirt. And you put your interpretation on them, okay? Fossils only exist in the present. They don't exist in the past. I mean, you're digging them up, and it's, it's 2005, okay? <laughs> you can't say, wow, this fossil is 40 million years old. You don't know that. Okay? All we do is put our interpretation on the fossils, but the kids are taught fossils contribute to our understanding of evolution. Kids, keep in mind, dead animals do not reproduce or evolve. Darwin said, if my theory is true, numberless intermediate species ought to have you know, been found in the fossil record. Well, I'm sorry. This guy said, since Darwin, many of these links have been found. Oh, they are lying to you. No missing links have been found. Even David Robb, who believes in evolution, says, in the years after Darwin, his advocates hoped to find predictable progressions. In general, these have not been found. Yet the optimism has died hard, and some pure fantasy has crept into textbooks. 
Oh, you're kidding. Fantasy in the textbooks? That's a fancy word for a lie, okay? And we could spend two days on the fossil record. There's no fossil record, and there are gaps all over the place. Every place where there ought to be something, they find nothing. No evidence for how the whale evolved, or how the birds evolved, or how the flowering plants evolved. No evidence whatsoever. If you find a fossil in the dirt, all you know is it died. You couldn't prove it had any kids, and you sure couldn't prove it had different kids. And why would you think a bone in the dirt can do something animals today cannot do? which is produce something other than their kind. Luther Sunderland wrote to major evolutionists all over and said, hey, where's the evidence for evolution? They wrote back and said, we don't have it, somebody else has it. He wrote to Colin Patterson because Patterson has access to the largest fossil collection in the world, British Museum of Natural History. Nobody's got more fossils than them. Patterson wrote a book about evolution, but he didn't show any missing links. So Sunderland wrote him a letter and said, uh, excuse me, uh, why didn't you show the missing links in your book? I'd like to see a picture of the missing link. Patterson wrote back and said, I fully agree with your comments on the lack of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any, fossil or living, I would certainly have included them. I will lay it on the line. There is not one such fossil. There are no missing links. The whole chain is missing. It's not a link they're looking for, folks. Even Stephen Gould said the absence of fossil evidence is a nagging problem for evolution. Yeah, it sure is. Stephen Gould died with a set of my videos on his shelf in his library. I hope he watched them. I donated them to him years ago, way before he died. Hopefully he watched them and got saved. I don't know. So Niles Eldridge and Stephen Gould have kind of resurrected the punctuated equilibria idea that came actually from Richard Gouldschmidt. Gouldschmidt said, the first bird hatched from a reptilian egg. They got so frustrated looking for missing links, they couldn't find any. They said, well, this just proves evolution happened quickly. Oh, I see, yeah. And this bird that hatched from the reptile egg, uh, excuse me, who did it marry? Hmm. Don't you have to have two in the same place of the opposite sex? I mean, what if you get two males? Huh? And don't they have to be at the same time in history? What if one's born just 10 years before the other one? Ah, just missed it. You've got to get them in the same place of the opposite sex at the same time, and they've got to be interested. You've got a whole bunch of problems, okay? Serious problems. Then they tell the kids to think critically. Which theory best describes the organism's evolution? Gradualism or punctuated equilibria? Look what they do. Kids, which theory is the best explanation? Slow evolution or fast evolution? Do you see how they're giving the kids two options, both of which are false? Which is correct, boys and girls? Elephants are orange or elephants are pink? Ah, uh, oh man. Mom, what should I write for this one? I don't know, honey. Go do your homework. They're neither one. You realize how frustrating this is for Christian kids to go through public schools and have this kind of stuff day after day after day and how it wears at their faith? And they finally just start giving the evolution answers. And 75% of the kids from Christian homes are being destroyed and losing their faith going through these public schools. That's not thinking critically. This textbook says, which is correct, boys and girls? Did evolution happen gradually or in short leaps and punctuated equilibria. They give them two options. Evolution happens slowly or evolution happened quickly. These guys are not capable of thinking outside the box. It didn't happen at all. Is that an option? But I guarantee if a kid puts it didn't happen at all on his test question, the teacher's going to count it wrong. I debated Dr. Pigliucci from Knoxville, Tennessee, UT, UT Knoxville. I said, Dr. Pigliucci, you've studied and taught evolution of plants for 10 years. You've received $650,000 in grant money to study the evolution of plants. What's the best evidence you know of for evolution? That was my question. His answer was, the evolution of whales. I said, just exactly what kind of plant is a whale anyway? Hmm? Yeah. He said, the hippo is evidence for evolution because it's in the process of adapting to an aquatic way of life. Hippos prove for evolution because it likes to go in the water. Wow, I like to go in the water, too. What's that mean? <laughs> Evolution's a shell game. Everybody thinks that somebody else has the evidence. The biologist says, oh, we don't have it. The geologist has it. The geologist says, oh, we don't have it. The anthropologist has it. It's a shell game with one major difference. You know how they put the P down there and try to get you confused, you know, which one has the P? Um, the difference is there's no P under any of them. 
Nobody has the evidence. Nobody. They're all lying. They say, what about horse evolution? Yes, boys and girls, you see this? The four-toed horse evolved to the one-toed horse. That's a lie proven wrong 55 years ago. The hyrax is the so-called four-toed horse. They're still alive today in Africa and, and Turkey. <laughs> There's a little bitty critter. There's one right there, a hyrax. They don't tell you the early horse had 18 pairs of ribs. The next one had 15. These animals are not even related. They just picked some bones and put them in order they wanted them. The next one had 19 and then back to 18. This horse evolution theory was proven wrong a long time ago. There's a whole variety of horses today, by the way, big ones and little ones. But back in 1950, G.G. Simpson, a famous evolutionist, said, this horse evolution was unintentionally falsified. It's not true. The evolution of the horse was all wrong. It never happened in nature. They've, horse evolution has not held up under close examination. The whole idea was made up by Othniel Marsh back in 1874. He picked animals from all over the world and put them in order the way he wanted it to happen. He never found them in that order, okay? Modern horses are found in the same layers as the so-called ancient horse. The ancient horse is just an animal still alive today in Turkey and East Africa. The ribs, toes, and teeth are different. In South America, the fossils are in the reverse order. Real problem. They're never found in the order presented in the textbooks. Tulsa Zoo finally took out their display because a friend of mine wrote him a letter and said, hey, uh, why do you have the horse evolution on display? I've got the letters here somewhere. Did you get those out, Steve? The, they're in the suitcase? Okay. You can come read those later. He wrote him a letter and said, guys, your horse evolution thing was proven wrong like uh, 50 years ago. You know, would you please remove the display? And they said, we don't have the funding to remove it. So he went to a sign shop and got a bid for a sign, 60 bucks or something, that says, we'll take this, the sign would say, we will take down this display as soon as we receive the funding, because the display is not accurate. He went into the curator at the zoo and said, uh, here's 60 bucks for the sign, this guy will make the sign, when would you like it delivered? He said, what's this? Oh, you're going to take down, the, we're going to take down the display when we get the funding. Yeah, he said, you at least warn the people, you know, the display is not right. Well, they didn't take it down. Finally, I forget, 2,000 people signed a petition saying, get this thing out of our zoo. It came on the evening news, 10 o'clock one night. Tulsa Zoo has a false display. Next morning, it was gone. They found the funding. Six months later, they put it back up. Yale University still has their horse evolution on display, proven wrong 55 years ago. Get more on the horse evolution in the book, Icons of Evolution. Just because you can arrange animals in order, that doesn't prove anything. Even if you find them buried in a certain order, that doesn't prove anything. If I get buried on top of a hamster, does that prove he's my grandpa? <laughs> no. Order of burial means nothing. But if you think you can arrange things and that somehow proves something, okay. I've been doing a lot of research on the evolution of the fork. I've pieced together fragmentary evidence for a long time. I believe, after studying this very intently, that the knife evolved first. Slowly, over millions of years, great geological pressures squeezed it and made it concave on one side, convex on the other, and squeezed it into a spoon. And then slowly, erosion cut grooves into the end and turned it into a fork. I knew I was onto something here, but I felt like I had a missing link, particularly between the spoon and the fork. I just couldn't find it. Till one day I was flying to Connecticut on U.S. Air. I was 30,000 feet off the ground, and the stewardess walked down the aisle and just handed me the missing link. I don't think she knew what she had, but my trained scientific eye picked it up right away. I said, wow, this is it. I've got it. I stuck it in my pocket. Later that day, I went to Popeye's Chicken and found another one. <laughs> there they are, folks, the missing links. So the evolution of silverware is nearly complete. Of course, we got a few mutant, mutants along the way, didn't quite survive for some reason, you know. And of course, people found out I was doing research on this. They all wanted to be famous, you know. So they tried to get in on the glory. They sent me their research. This one was an obvious fork head on a spoon handle. I mean, look, it didn't get by me. I caught it right away, you know. They don't get stuff, I don't, get, I don't fall for stuff like that. Even the races, of course, evolved over the long ways. But uh, look, if you want to arrange things, you can turn a cat to a cot to a dot to a dog by changing one letter at a time. You can play with this for a while and turn yourself into a fool when you're done. <laughs> they say dinosaurs turn to birds. There are very few ideas as dumb as this one. The Bible says God made the birds on day five. He made the reptiles on day six. 
Evolution says reptiles came first and then the birds. You know, everything about evolution is backwards to the Bible. Everything. But this article says, dinosaurs alive as birds, scientist says. Oh, wow, scientist says. Well, that proves it right there. <laughs> Just like it gives some kind of authority. Wow, scientist says. This is absurd. Everything about the bird evolution is baloney. Okay? Archaeoraptor was listed in 1999 as the missing link. Yes, boys and girls, breaking news, National Geographic, we found the missing link. They had a whole big article about the missing link has been discovered. Then a couple months later, oops, it was proven wrong. You know, everything about these feathered dinosaurs has been proven baloney. But guess what? They're still teaching it. Here's a whole book, The Feathered Dinosaurs of China. Well, you just got this recently? Why would they still be teaching something that's been proven wrong for five years? All this feathered dinosaur stuff is baloney. It's all baloney. We cover more on that in one of the debates I did. I forget which one, but uh, they say birds are descendants of dinosaurs. Well, kids, in case you don't know, <clears throat> there are a few differences between a dinosaur and a bird. Okay, you don't just put a few feathers on them and say, come on, man, give it a try. It won't hurt too bad. <laughs> it's just not that easy. See, reptiles have four perfectly good legs. Birds have two legs and two wings. So if his front legs are going to change to wings, um, somewhere along the line they're going to be half leg and half wing. Which means on that particular day he can't run anymore and he still can't fly yet, so he's got a real problem. <laughs> Serious problem. They say Archaeopteryx is proof of it for evolution. You got one here on the table, brother? Archaeopteryx. Whenever you buy a bag of dinosaurs, they almost always stick one of these in there. Archaeopteryx. Wow. And this somehow gets an impression to the kids. Wow, we got proof that dinosaurs turned to birds. Here's one here with feathers on it. They're lying. It's still in the textbooks. I mean, today, about Archaeopteryx, and it's been proven years ago, Archaeopteryx was just a bird, a perching bird. Alan Fiducia, who believes in evolution, says it's not a missing link. It had the right features for flight. All the features of the brain were for flight, okay? Archaeopteryx means ancient wing, and he had claws on his wings. Well, that's kind of unusual, okay. But 12 birds today have claws on their wings. The swan, the ibis, the hoatzin, several birds have claws. They say, well, he had teeth in his beak. Well, not many birds have teeth. Some do. Here's a hummingbird has teeth in his beak. But most birds don't have teeth, I agree. Actually, some mammals have teeth, some don't. Some birds have teeth, some don't. Some fish have teeth, some don't. Some of you have teeth, some don't, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> missing link. <coughs> The Chinese dino bird was a forgery, and we don't have time to cover all that today, but we give lots more on that on the, uh, one of the debates I did. It's true feathers and scales are both made of keratin, same building block, that's true, but that's where the similarity stops, okay? Actually, birds and reptiles have different lung system, different reproductive system, different body covering, different brain, I mean a th different circulatory system. Thousands of differences exist between dinosaurs and birds. That could be a whole seminar by itself. It's interesting, there are two different kinds of dinosaurs, the bird hip and the lizard hip dinosaur. Their hips are very different. Ask an evolutionist, which type of dinosaur evolved into the bird? Was it the bird hip or the lizard hip? And they will probably kind of hang their head and quietly say, well, it was, it was the lizard hip. Oh, so now the hip's got to turn around backwards too. In addition to the billions of other changes you've got to make, there's no evidence of how dinosaurs evolved to birds, none. Zero. So who's right? Well, Richard Dawkins said, it's absolutely safe to say if you meet someone who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is ignorant, stupid, or insane, or wicked. Sounds like he's open for a discussion. When I went to England, we tried everything to get to debate Richard Dawkins. He refused. He hung up on my secretary. I, his secretary hung up on me when, when I called back. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your mind. There's no mental reason to reject Christianity. It's a logical deduction to say, hey, there must have been a designer. You see something complicated like this world, you say, hey, there must have been a designer. Evolution's not a fact. It's not even a good theory. It's not even a hypothesis. It's a metaphysical research program. Julian Huxley said, I suppose the reason we left at Origin of Species was the idea of God interfered with our sexual mores. We don't want God telling us what to do. Evolution is a religion. Even uh, Michael Ruse said that. He said, I'm an ardent evolutionist and an ex-Christian. 
But I must admit that in this one complaint, Mr. Gish is but one of many to make it. The literalists are absolutely right. Evolution is a religion. This was true of evolution in the beginning, and it's true of evolution still today. We believe in evolution because the only alternative is creation. And that's right. That is the only alternative. One Russian atheist astronomer came over here to America, and he was speaking at the university, and he said, Folks, either there is a God or there isn't. I thought, wow, now that's a brilliant conclusion to come to. <laughs> but then he said, both possibilities are frightening. I thought, wow, now that is a brilliant statement. See, if there is a God, we better find out who he is and find out what he wants and do what he says. If there is no God, we're in trouble. We're hurtling through space at 66,000 miles an hour and nobody's in charge. That's a scary thought. Even uh, one famous scientist said, this evolution, transformationism, is a fairy tale for adults. The theory has helped nothing in the progress of science. It is useless. Even if evolution theory is true, it's useless. It's of no value to science whatsoever. Evolution is a kind of dogma which its own priests no longer believe, but which they uphold for the people. Even most scientists don't believe in this, but they're afraid of losing their job or their research grant money or they're afraid of peer pressure. No different than a fifth grader afraid what the other fifth graders think of them. We've got college professors out there teaching these lies that I've covered just because they, they have to because, you know, that's their job. Muggeridge said, I'm convinced the theory of evolution will be one of the great jokes in the history books of the future. Satan is a liar. And everything about this theory is based on lies. Even uh, uh, Thomason said, these evolution, people who go about teaching evolution are great con men. The story they are telling may be the greatest hoax ever. We do not have one iota fact to support this evolution theory. So Fred Hoyle, the famous astronomer, said, Well, life is so complicated, it could not have evolved on Earth, so it must have come from outer space. <laughs> well, duh. All that does is postpone the problem. How did it happen out there? Hmm. This guy says, Evolution is a light which illuminates all facts. All lines of thought must follow. This is what evolution is. Well, Pierre Deschard and the Catholic priest that got most of the Catholics to believe in evolution, including the Pope, who's three times now said, we believe in evolution. Pierre Deschard is one of the guys responsible for the great Piltdown hoax. He's a liar. Absolute bald-faced liar. God's Word is a light. Okay? Not evolution is a light. But if a kid goes 12 or 15 years to school in your school system, how's he going to view the world? Probably like an evolutionist. Why would they teach these lies? Well, some people think that if everybody believes in evolution, that will make it true. <laughs> it doesn't matter if everybody believed in it. That wouldn't make it true yet, okay? Some people teach the lie to keep the paycheck coming in. Kids, there are teachers that don't believe in evolution, but they keep teaching it anyway, because they like their paycheck every Friday. And they will lie to you to keep their paycheck coming in. Some understand the bigger picture, how evolution is the foundation for the new world order. We cover more on that on seminar part five. Evolution is the foundation for Marxism, Nazism, communism, socialism. That's why when I do debates, I always call it creation versus evolutionism. It drives them nuts, you know, because they're used to saying, oh, it's evolution versus creationism. They always put the ism on creation. So when I flash up my sign at the beginning, it says, creation versus evolutionism debate. They always sit there with that puzzled look on their face. They're trying to read it thinking, you know, something doesn't look right about that, but I, I don't know what it is. <laughs> Just get the little jab in there, you know. Why do people believe in evolution? Well, you might want to get this book, The Case Against Darwin. Excellent. Short book, quick read for, for your intellectual friends that want to uh, get the quick picture. Some people, that's all they've ever been taught. When I spoke in Russia, I was over there at the university. There were 30 professors came in to hear me speak. And after about an hour, one of the professors was crying. And I asked the interpreter, I said, what's, what's he crying about? And she said, he's never heard the, evolu he's never heard the creation story. He didn't know there was one. All he's ever heard is evolution. He wants you to keep going. I went for another hour. I spoke at a public school over there in Russia. The room would seat 400 kids. They had 700 high schoolers come in there and listen to me for two hours. I mean, you could have heard a pin drop the whole time. I couldn't believe it. 
When I asked the principal before I started, I said, hey, uh, are there any things I shouldn't say to these kids? I know this is a public school. It's kind of sensitive. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, I'm a Christian. Is it okay to tell them, you know, talk, mention the Bible? He said, oh, yeah. Talk, tell them anything you want. I said, well, would it be okay if I told them, you know, how to go to heaven? He said, sure, sure, please do. These kids would love to hear about Christianity. They've never heard any of this. <laughs> wow. Door you can drive a truck through, brother. But they use the same lies in Russian textbooks. Here's a Russian textbook talking about the forelimb, proving evolution, and the different geologic column strata, all the stuff we covered earlier. So why do they believe this stuff? Well, some believe it because that's all they've been taught. Some, their job depends on it. Some, they hope there's no God to answer to. They did not like to retain God in their knowledge, the Bible says. They just don't like this idea. And it says, God will send them strong delusion. The more I think about this, that is so true. Anybody that believes they came from a rock 4.6 billion years ago has to be strongly deluded. Think about it. Oh, there's so much we could cover on this. Some people simply have too much pride to admit they have been wrong all their life. So, kids are being taught evolution. There's no question about it. The kids are being lied to in these textbooks. There's no question about it. What do we do about it? Well, we cover that in great detail on our public school presentation on uh, the Green series of tapes. Get the public school presentation. We'll tell you step by step what to do, how to get these lies out of your textbook, how you can get on the school textbook selection committee, how you can get your kid exempt from class, Parents, if, you're, if your kids are in a public school, you should send a little note to the teacher saying, I don't want my child taught evolution. It's against my religious convictions. Sign it, notarize it if you'd like, give it to the teacher and to the principal. Then if they continue giving you a hard time, you say, oh, now, excuse me, do you discriminate against people because of their religious convictions? Watch their eyes light up on that one. And if they still give you a hard time, contact me. I got some lawyers waiting in the wings that are anxious to get a lawsuit like that. Title 42, discrimination based on religion. Wow. That principal's going to be the garbage collector the next week. I guarantee you that principal's going to call that teacher in and say, look, let this kid out of class. Stop teaching evolution. I had one guy call me a couple years ago. He said, Brother Hovind, my second grade daughter's teacher just called me. And the teacher said, Mr. Jones, whatever his name was, I forget. He said, your second grader's in my class, your daughter, and she stops me every time I start teaching something about evolution. And the teacher said, I've just decided I'm going to skip this evolution stuff for the rest of the year until your daughter's out of my class. <laughs> and my first thought was, yay. And then I thought, wait, 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 wait. Why are we sending second graders off to war? This is a battle the parents ought to be fighting, not the kids. We're the salt of the earth. Salt irritates. Hey, if nobody's irritated at you, you're not a good Christian. You don't have to try to irritate them. You try to be salty. That will irritate them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Salt preserves from corruption. How come you got so many lies in the textbooks right here in Tennessee in the middle of the Bible Belt? Where's the Christians that are supposed to preserve the world, huh? Why don't some of you get on the school board and do something about this? Why don't some of you get a committee to say, hey, let's take these pages out of the book. This is a lie. It won't cost the school anything. I'll show you. How many of you would volunteer to take the pages out of the book and bring your own scissors? <laughs> Won't cost the school a dime. Oh, let's, let's do better than that. How many of you would pay $20 for the privilege of being on the committee to cut the pages out of the book and still bring your own scissors? <laughs> we just had a fundraiser. We just raised a thousand bucks for the school. Wow. Won't cost them a dime. There are many good, sincere, godly public school teachers, and I praise God for them. And they are as frustrated as I am with what's going on. If you've got a good teacher in your school that wants to do what's right, support them. Because I guarantee if there's a teacher that tries to get up and stand up for creation and against evolution, there's a good possibility they'll get fired or get persecuted for it. We cover much more on that on video number seven, how teachers get persecuted for standing up for what's right. Many teach this theory because they simply have never been taught anything else. Many don't know it's okay to teach creation. It's perfectly fine. Well, what do we do? Well, there's a long history of how we got this theory in our schools, and we'll cover all that in the public school presentation. And what do we do about it? It's all covered on videotape number five. We'll show you the dangers of this theory. It's not just a dumb idea. It's a dangerous religion. And then tell you some real practical steps to fix it on seminar part five. Thank you for joining us.
We hope you've enjoyed this video series on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. Much more important, though, than knowing all the truth and facts about science is to know the truth about whether you're going to heaven or not. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, uh, let me explain quickly what you need to do to go to heaven. The Bible says we're all sinners. We've all broken God's laws. We've disobeyed the Creator. We've, we've done wicked things. We're sinners. Some are worse than others, at least in man's eyes, but we've all broken God's laws. And the Bible says you have to repent. The word repent means to turn. It actually means two things, to turn from your sin and to turn to God. God's looking for a change in your attitude where you say, Lord, I don't want to do wrong anymore. I'm sorry, I've offended you. I want to do right. And you turn from sin and you turn to God and say, God, would you please forgive me? Would you save me? The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You need to admit you're a sinner. Number two, the Bible says in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. We deserve to die and go to hell because of our sin. But Jesus died for you. He loves you. He wants you to come to heaven. And anybody that will ask him for the free salvation, God will give you the gift of eternal life, it says in Romans 6, 23. It's a free gift. And it says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you would just call and say, Lord, I'm a sinner, would you please forgive me? And ask him. He will give you that free gift of eternal life. Why don't you just pray with me right now and you could receive Christ as your Savior. There's no magic words. God's looking at your heart. But if you could say this and mean it, God would forgive you. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please apply your blood to my account. And forgive my sins and take me to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says, if you call upon the Lord, you shall be saved. So if you've asked the Lord to save you, He promised He'd save you. Now your job is to grow. Read your Bible, pray, get involved in a good Bible-believing church, and begin to grow to be a good Christian. Thank you so much. Call or write if we can be any help at all. We'd be glad to help. For more information on the Ministry of Creation Science Evangelism, write us at Creation Science Evangelism, P.O. Box 37338, Pensacola, Florida, 32526, USA or call us at 850-479-3466. That's 850-479-DINO. You may also visit us on the web at www.drdino.com. That's www.drdino.com.